Okay, let's call to order these community meetings for the planning committee. Through you, Mr. Chair, I can confirm we do indeed have quorum, uh, so and with no regrets. Uh, I just wanted to quickly remind everybody that tonight is a community meeting. And so if you'd like to be notified moving forward, there is sign-in sheets for both the community uh, meetings being held tonight at the uh, back of the room over there. Uh, if you wish to speak in chamber, there are two areas that are the best place for you to speak uh, when it comes time for the public to speak after the two presentations from the uh, applicants. First is on my right here, right at the end of that bench there. And then the other one is on the other side of the room over there. Um, you need to press the little button at the bottom and it will turn red around the top here and you're good to go. I also just want to quickly uh, remind everybody here tonight that the planning, uh, that the uh, community meetings are, uh, there's no recommendation, there's no decision being made tonight. Um, and we look forward to, uh, I'm sure staff and the committee look forward to hearing all the comments. Thank you. I'm going to go over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The meetings being held tonight are public meetings held under the Planning Act. Personal information collected as a result of the public meetings are collected under the authority of the Planning Act and will be used to assist in making a decision on this matter. Persons speaking at the meeting are requested to give their name and address for recording in the minutes. All names, addresses, opinions, and comments may be collected and may form part of the minutes, which will be available to the public. Additionally, interested members of the public can email the committee clerk or the assigned planner if they wish to be notified regarding a particular application. Questions regarding this collection should be forwarded to the Director of Planning Services. Tonight's meetings are to present planning applications in a public forum as detailed in the community meeting report. These reports do not contain a staff recommendation and therefore no decisions will be made this evening. Each application in the community meeting report will be presented individually and following each presentation by the applicant, the meeting will be open to the public for comments and questions. Following council decision, notice will be circulated in accordance with the Planning Act. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the Ontario Land Tribunal, but the person or public body does not make an oral submission at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kingston before the bylaws passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the appeal. So the first committee meeting. The purpose of the committee community meeting is to provide the applicant with an opportunity to present a potential development proposal in the early stages of the development process and to seek feedback from the public and members of, committee, of the planning committee before a complete application is submitted to the city. Anyone who attends a community meeting may present an oral submission and or provide a written submission on the proposal being presented. So let us begin with Exhibit A. 279 Wellington Street and 49 Plast Arms. May we have the applicant's presentation, please? My name is Tess Gilchrist and I am a professional planner with Arcadis, formerly IBI Group, and I'm joined this evening by several members of the project team, including Christina Bogza and Sandra Sordu. They're the development proponents and they're joining us virtually, as well as Alistair Kirkwood, the project architect and principal of GSA Studio Inc., as well as Ben Holtoff, senior heritage planner with LHC. And I'm also joined in person here with my professional planning colleague, uh, Mark Tao at Arcadis. Next slide, please. You oh, right. Thank you. Thank you. I can do that. So we are here this evening for the community meeting associated with a zoning bylaw amendment application for 279 Wellington Street and 49 Plast Arms. The proposed 14-story, 158-unit apartment building conforms to official plan policies and is a permitted use in the downtown one zone. 
but does require site-specific zoning relief. And so the zoning amendment application was filed June 30th, and the city is currently reviewing the submission. And uh, we're anticipating final comments uh, after the meeting this evening. The, <clears throat> do excuse me, the existing parcel is 1.47 hectares in size and is currently occupied by a five-story commercial office building and its associated surface parking. It has frontage on Wellington Street, Plast Arms, and is also has also has frontage on the terminus of King Street East adjacent to Frontenac Village. The property is bound by Anglin parking lot to the north, uh, where Bay Street terminates at Wellington Street. Anglin Bay is located to the northeast, which forms part of the Rideau Canal UNESCO World Heritage Site, as well as being a National Historic Site of Canada and a Canadian Heritage River. It is also adjacent to four designated properties under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act, one property listed under Section 27, and one protected view in the OP. And it's noted that the McDonald Cartier building uh, has potential cultural heritage value of interest. So a new 14 story building is proposed on the northern half of the subject lands, uh, which is currently an area of surface parking for the existing office building. The existing building on the southern half of the subject lands, the McDonald Cartier building, is to remain. And so a future consent application would sever an approximately 0.42 hectare parcel from the existing property. The proposed development consists of a 14-story, 158-unit apartment building with five levels of structured parking, one below grade and four above. Of the 158 units, there are a total of 228 bedrooms. There are three live-work units proposed at grade along Wellington Street, while the remaining 155 units are located on floors 5 to 14. The proposed parking structure will accommodate 262 parking spaces, which includes spaces for the new residential use, as well as the replacement of all those lost surface parking spaces for which the building is located upon and benefits the existing office building. A total of 174 bicycle parking spaces are proposed, which is the equivalent of a 1.1 uh, space per, per unit ratio. Amenity space will be provided through shared indoor and outdoor communal space, as well as uh, within private balconies and patios. The development of the subject lands would also include the conveyance of parkland in the form of a three meter wide pedestrian walkway adjacent to the eastern property limit. The walkway would connect the public parking lot to the north with King Street East, supporting the continuity of the city's waterfront path across the downtown area as set out in the waterfront master plan. The streetscape of the live work units along Wellington Street includes uh, a mix of soft and hard landscaped areas with plantings and individual walkways, uh, which provide visual interest, but also a level of privacy and delineation from the public right of way. The remainder of the landscape design is geared towards providing natural buffers, uh, which double as accents to the building space. Uh, locally native and hardy plants will be selected as the design develops to ensure compatibility and longevity. And so as shown in the conceptual landscape plan here, approximately 27% of the property uh, is to be provided as landscaped open space. And also noting uh, a, a tree inventory has been done for the property. And there are a total of 46 trees currently on the property, of which 25 are proposed to be retained and of the 22, or rather 21 to be removed, tree replacement is anticipated at a minimum of a one to one ratio. Access to the proposed development is proposed via the existing southerly driveway on Wellington Street. Uh, the new building has an enclosed loading space and is also um, would be adjacent to where waste and recycling will be in stored inside the building. <clears throat> I would also note uh, the floodplain uh, has 
been identified by CRCA as being an elevation of 76.3 meters, and it's been mapped by Topo Survey, and the proposed development will be located outside the floodplain and in accordance with minimum setbacks. The proposed underground parking level is beyond 15 meters horizontal from the floodplain elevation below grade, and the building is set back a minimum of six meters from the floodplain elevation above grade. The 30 meter setback from the Rideau Canal is also achieved, as well as being located outside the riparian corridor. As per zoning, no development or site alteration is proposed within the required 10 meter water setback and no buildings or structures are proposed within 30 meters of the high water mark. The conceptual elevation shown here, west and south, uh, the building is comprised, as I mentioned, four levels of parking with 10 residential stories above. So above the four-story podium, the massing of the building takes its stepped back shape and is designed with influence from a number of nearby forms, such as the McDonald Cartier Building and Frontenac Village, which also feature visually interesting sawtooth or zigzag patterns. The application of numerous step backs helps avoid a continuous vertical wall and provides visual interest. It also affords private outdoor uh, uh, rooftop areas for amenity, uh, supplementing ground level landscape and overall provision of amenity space. The building is comprised of a collection of smaller forms where materiality and articulation are used to distinguish them. This variation effectively reduces uh, the apparent mass of the building, provides a visually attractive appearance and a quality backdrop for the street frontage as well as uh, downtown when viewed from across the water. The overall architectural character is both uh, complementary and progressive when compared to the surrounding community. Conceptual elevations for the east and north sides are shown here. And again, the designed function of the building uh, responds to the site by directing interaction and activity towards the street and internal parking area. And the north and east facades provide a, a highly attractive view from the water and for those using the waterfront trail. In plan, the sawtooth pattern of the northeast facade uh, maximizes views of the waterfront and adds further visual, visual interest. The, I'm gonna go over planning policy fair, at a fairly high level, but of course we're available to answer any detailed questions. Uh, proposed development is consistent with PPS policies in that the proposed residential intensification and efficient utilization of land would contribute 158 new dwelling units within the urban area while making use of existing public infrastructure and facilities. It also supports public transit and active transportation, adequately manages stormwater runoff, and is compatible with adjoining land uses. The property is designated Central Business District and North Block and Environs in the downtown and harbor specific policy area. These designations permit the proposed high density residential use and are areas intended for intensification, recognizing that intensification supports the vitality of downtown. The policies also support the proposed inclusion of ground oriented live work units to mask the parking structure and contribute to a human scale streetscape. An urban design study was prepared in support of the proposed building height increase as per OP policy. Uh, as per Schedule 9 of the OP, a protected view is identified from Bay Street looking eastward towards the water for those traveling from the St. Lawrence Ward Heritage, or Heritage Character Area when examining the existing view <clears throat> excuse me, existing Anglin Bay parking lot and the Frontenac Village condos beyond are the uh, focal point. The superimposition of the building's mass is shown here uh, beyond the six-story apartments on Bay Street and the proposal uh, does not block or detract from the integrity of the existing protected view. The subject property is zoned 
downtown zone one, which does permit a range of residential, commercial, and community uses, uh, including apartment buildings. Pardon me. The purpose of the zoning amendment application is to establish a building envelope and residential density in order to permit the proposed uh, apartment building. So the, and I'll run through the uh, items here of site-specific relief. So we're proposing a total of 375 dwelling units per net hectare. Uh, the zoning amendment also seeks to add live work street oriented units with a setback of three meters on Wellington Street. And uh, the apartment building is permitted, but the three uh, street oriented units would have independent entrances from the street uh, separate from the apartment building. The three meter setback is generally in line with the abutting building to provide a continuous street wall. An increase to height under the angular plane is requested for 14 stories and a total of 49 meters, as well as amending the angular plane at the front and rear of the building. And the current downtown one zone permits up to six stories under the angular plane, uh, but not to exceed 25.5 meters. A reduction to the minimum drive aisle width of 6.7 meters is requested, but only within areas of the parking garage uh, where parking spaces are not adjacent to the drive aisle, uh, where there's um, the need for backup distance 6.7 is, is achieved. The existing southerly access on Wellington Street is proposed to, to be continued to use uh, for both properties as a shared access and it's currently 19.6 meters wide, whereas the zoning bylaw permits a maximum width of a driveway within the required front yard of no greater than 6.7. Looks like I lost a couple points at the bottom of this slide, but uh, relief is also being sought for mechanical and elevator penthouse projections within the rooftop area, um, as well as <clears throat> Uh, increase to the maximum provision for 30% of the horizontal length of each face of the main wall of each story to be occupied by balconies um, and here we're proposing 60%. Uh, so in conclusion it's uh, our professional opinion that the proposed development is an appropriate and well-considered design concept for the subject site as it implements key elements of guiding policy documents as well as best practices in urban design. Overall, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment maintains the intent of the official plan as it is aligned with achieving the sustainability and residential growth goals outlined by the City of Kingston and is consistent with the intent of the overall direction for growth and development within the city. More specifically, the proposed development is located in an intensifying special policy area within the urban boundary and will utilize existing municipal infrastructure and service facilities. Uh, will also efficiently develop an underutilized parcel of land within the urban area. The proposed development helps to achieve overall intensification targets within a serviced area close to public transit in the city's downtown while meeting urban design objectives and principles for the downtown and harbour area. The high density residential use is compatible with adjacent land uses and meets the functional needs of site users. So that does conclude my presentation, thank you. But uh, we look forward to uh, responding to any questions from members of public. Um, either attending in person or virtually this evening, as well as members of planning committee. And I'm joined uh, here at the front by my planning colleague, Mark Tao. Thank you. Thank you. Outstanding. So now we will move to the public portion, or the public comments on this. We would ask that you ask questions or comments, uh, that you have five minutes. If you feel that you have not expressed it enough, we ask you to finish off with an email to either the clerk or the planner. Uh, so that we have everybody, so that everybody has a chance to speak. Uh, when you come to the mic, please give your name and your address to be presented in the minutes, and then I will start your timer. 
So who shall we begin with? And I also just, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, just want to quickly recognize there are members on Zoom as well. If you'd like to speak to this application, please raise your virtual hand and I'll be able to see you and recognize you. Um, so members of the public, if you would like to speak to this application, um, if you could kindly make your way to one of the podiums and uh, just kind of raise your hands as we keep calling and we're going to collect the questions and comments all together. And then uh, depending on how many people are speaking, Mr. Chair, it might be prudent to do batches of five to allow the applicant the opportunity to respond to any emerging questions. Thank you. Okay, all right. Yes, my name is uh, Rob Oldfield. I live at 268 Wellington Street. Uh, I've lived there for, lived and worked there for over 40 years, so I know this area quite well. My question that I, that I want to ask you is to do with the parking issues. Um, I just want to get some clarification on that. You mentioned that with this building, there's going to be a one underground and four levels uh, above ground of parking. And I've written down, you're providing 262 parking spaces. Is that, is that right? Um, those parking spaces, um, are they, I know you're going to be taking away some of the parking from behind the OHIP building. And are they, are some of those parking places that you're giving back? Or are you, are you considering those parking places that are already there as part of the, part of your parking uh, you know, numbers. Through you, Mr. Chair, just to remind all members of the public, we're going to get all the questions and comments all at once, so multiple different members of the public, and then the applicant will be able to reply to the questions at the end of the public speaking. So if you have additional comments or questions, please answer them now, and then they'll collate them and reply back once everyone is finished speaking. Okay, I have one other question then, and one other um, concern, and this has to do with both of these applications that are tonight, that are these proposals that are doing. And that has to do with traffic studies. Um, I know that there's a traffic study that was done for your building. There's a traffic study that was done for 64 Barrack Street. There was traffic studies done for other, um, other things that are being done at the, OHIP, or the Homestead properties and the one up at the old Capitol Theater. They're all separate. Um, my concern, and I would put this out to both of these proposals, is why is there not one large traffic study that encompasses all of the ramifications of these new builds, these big new builds in the downtown North Block area? Um, the, I, I consider there's going to be some real issues with parking and with traffic related to the increase in um, the number of people living in the area. We live in the area. I've seen, I observe it almost every day, you know, the traffic uh, and the parking issues uh, that occur. I've tried to read the, the traffic reports. They're not easy to read. <laughs> um, but I try to get a sense of what is going on here. And I, and I really have concerns about traffic and parking in this area as it pertains to these two buildings that are being proposed, plus the other buildings that Homestead is building and the one on the Capitol, the old Capitol Theater property. They're all, they all interact. And um, I, you know, I, I just have an issue with that. The other thing I would like to bring up, and this is more for the other one, and I don't know if I should mention that now, is, is the, why these heights? Why are these heights being, um, being put forward for these buildings in historic old downtown Kingston? I know there's a change in the, in the official plan. I don't even know why we even have an official plan for the North Block. But uh, anyways, um, these heights are, these are, these are big buildings. And um, they're going to massively change the outlook and the busyness area 
of these areas. I have other comments that I'd like to make, but I'll save, but I'll save those for uh, later, uh, possibly after the uh, next presentation. Okay? Thank you. Anyone else? Please, come on up. Oh, if you would mind using the one just back there, they're a bit easier to use. So when it's red, it's on? That's counterintuitive. <laughs> Usually green means go. My name is Kathleen O'Hara. I live at 91 King Street East. I wasn't actually planning on speaking because I just heard about this meeting. For a public meeting, I think maybe they should be better uh, publicized. Um, I'm with No Clear Cuts Kingston, and we're usually worried about our natural heritage. I've just learned that 21 more trees in Kingston will be removed. We've had, we've counted up to, sorry, this chair's a bit funny. We've counted up to 20 clear cuts past and proposed. Uh, this won't be a clear cut, but it will be a loss of more trees downtown and in the city. Um, I agree with the last speaker. What kind of Kingston do we want? We are, I think we're at a, not a crossroads, but things are happening very quickly. We just um, okayed Queen and Barry at 15 stories. And um, I know that shoppers could go up to 20 at the top of Princess, and we're going to have these monstrosities by Homestead at 19 and 23 stories. Um, and then I guess we're going to be hearing about good life at 25 stories. This is going to be the end of a beautiful historic downtown. Make no, I mean, there's no question about it. And so anyone who has any power has to acknowledge that. You decide what the future of Kingston is going to be. And I talked to a developer who wants to build downtown, and I said, you're killing the go goose that lays the golden eggs, the tourism business. And he said, oh, the goose is already dead. Well, why do we have our little trolley going around? When we're out trying to tell people about no clear cuts, we run into so many tourists. They're not going to come here if we look like Mississauga. They simply won't, and we're almost at the tipping point. So I think we have to acknowledge that for everything we, um, every benefit we get out of high rises downtown, we're going to lose a heck of a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, let me just see if I've written anything down. Oh well, yes, we should have learned about. Uh, what we shouldn't be doing by Williamsville. I, I hear so many people complaining about the ugliness and the user unfriendliness of Will Williamsville. No trees, ugly buildings, crowded, just not what we need in this city. And they're just, the developers are just going to keep pushing and pushing because it makes money. Now we do need housing. But the official plan says that this could be six, maybe even eight stories. Why not more eight-story buildings instead of the high-rises? The rest is profit. And we don't need to cater to, to builders, developers' profits. We're here to build a beautiful, livable city, not to cater to profits of a few, of a rich few who want to live in big houses and have boats off the coast of Spain. Uh, so I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. You have five minutes and your name and your address, please. Hello, I'm Leslie Rudy. I live at 560 Albert Street. Um, I'm the science coordinator for Turtles Kingston and I'm speaking on behalf of Turtles Kingston today. Um, I just want to bring forward uh, a concern that we have about uh, the potential impact of this development. 
Um, there's already a significant problem area there, right there, uh, where turtles are coming out of the water and are attempting to find places to nest, and they're getting hit by cars. Um, so it's already a dangerous area that we're uh, looking to mitigate um, those threats to turtles um, at that site, those, those parking lots, um, and crossing Wellington and Bay. We've had two adult female uh, map turtles struck and killed there this year. Um, and so I'm wondering if uh, the developer has um, knows about this, I guess, and will uh, take this into account in the development plans, and if so, how. Um, I'm, we're very concerned about the, the construction itself as well as the increase in traffic uh, that this development would bring. Um, there maybe are some ways that these, this, the threats could be mitigated, so uh, we'd like to see um, some thought put into that. Uh, including potential nesting sites, as well as ways to uh, keep turtles safe while construction is going on and safe from traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this proposal? Please come on down. Uh, thank you. My name is Judith McKenzie. I live at uh, One Place Arm, which in the uh, visuals is the immediate neighbor to the proposed site. So I'm intensely curious about the statement that this proposal is compatible with uh, land uses, with the existing land uses. So I'm in a three-story condominium, and right next door is proposed a 14-story building. I don't understand what the definition is for the criteria that were used to make that rather startling statement, especially when you look around at the uh, nearby marina, uh, the townhouses on Wellington Street, I could go on and on. So I would like to know what criteria were used in order to make that statement. Um, I'm also curious as to what will need to be done if indeed that is a landfill site, a three-story building on, we're on a landfill site, and, uh, but we're only three stories. A 14-story building, I suspect, would need some quite different preparation for that size and weight of building to be on a landfill site, but I haven't seen any reference to that what work could be done. The worst case scenario is a, a massive number of beams driven down to support the building. And I think all the nearby residential neighbors would go stark raving mad should that happen. Um, I um, wondered, I noted there was a statement that the um, density level is 375 units uh, per hectare. And can somebody tell me what the current uh, use, uh, density level is, say, of the townhouses on Wellington Street, or in fact of my own site? I'd like to know what that range of difference is. I would like to know how the facade for the four levels of parking are to be presented in terms of design. Most parking garages designs, uh, open garages, are absolutely hideous and no benefit uh, visually to the neighborhood, so I'd like to know some, some detail about that. And uh, I guess as a final statement, the number of high-rise buildings and considerable high-rise buildings going into the historic downtown area is drastically changing the appearance and the whole ambience of the downtown. Are tourists really expected to come to look at a whole series of high-rises? I don't think they would be. And uh, I'm, I'm disappointed that the city has decided to move away from presenting itself as a unique kind of community in Canada. Uh, we were described as the uh, press rows in the pages of Canadian history by Hugh Windsor many years ago in a publication, uh, probably at least 25 years ago. I don't think he'll be able to, he would be able to say that anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Go ahead, Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation. 
I believe the proposal is too tall, too massive, and clashes with the generally low and medium style of the neighborhood. I'm gonna give my address. Or did I already give it? For, okay. So I don't live in the area, I'm a Williamsville resident. Um, I walk down there frequently, know it quite well. I would be more in agreement with a height of up to 50% above the existing official plan maximum of 25.5 meters, or about 38 meters down from the proposed nearly 50 meters, or eight stories down from the proposed 14 stories. I believe there may be significant previous environmental site issues associated with historical use. The Ontario Health Building has had many employees affected by health-related issues contracted by working there. This definitely needs to be addressed in detail and was omitted entirely from the presentation. A previous landfill site. So I'll give this to the clerk. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes, please go ahead. Your name and your address, please. Oh, hi, oh, good evening. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, Michael Purcell, uh, 300 Wellington. We're one of the four townhouses across the street from the development and the existing entrances to parking. Uh, we, have, we were flooded out in 2011, and we've had um, water instances in 17 and 19 and 23 that uh, uh, cover the street and have been high enough that they would go into the lobby and the, um, uh, the lower building or the lower buildings at the front of the building. So uh, we're looking to ensure that an approval has a, an agreement between the city and the developer to identify how to uh, handle the stormwater. Our kid has been very good to talk to. We actually had a meeting with them. Um, I have sent in written comments and pictures. Uh, the, um, in our meeting, they said they took them into account, which was great, and they had suggested that they would be putting more onto uh, King Street and not all onto Wellington or redirecting it, but um, King Street already is flooding and they have a uh, gas-powered pump that they have to roll out the hose and pump into the harbor when there's a heavy rainfall. So both streets, um, or on both sides of this uh, development have a um, substantial flooding problem and we don't wish to have it. We'd like it corrected for one thing because we, we uh, used up our entire $30,000 insurance in 2011 um, and the rain was longer than uh, what's in the study which is 15 minutes and, and the water comes down from Rideau, down Ordnance, down um, from above and uh, comes down for a substantial period of time. Uh, they indicate a two, five, hundred year um, design criteria, which is fine, but I haven't seen, of the four instances that we know of, I haven't seen them identified as a two, five, or a hundred. So um, if they weren't the hundred, then I have to be really concerned. Uh, the secondary issue would be the parking, or the entrance, uh, right now, there is the traffic goes in across from Bages and across from our townhouses. Um, it's not particularly a problem. Uh, the trucks backing up with the beeping at six in the morning is a bit of a pain in the butt, but uh, for the most part, it doesn't uh, cause any traffic problems. Uh, so all the existing traffic going in there, um, they'll be adding the other parking lot and then they'll be adding another uh, 150 or the 252 or whatever the number ends up is all going to be coming that one entrance. Um, they've indicated concerns about the flood, the floodplain, uh, which is legitimate. Um, but there is an entrance off of Plast Arms near the end of King Street, uh, and potentially Bay Street on the drawings that they provided goes actually down into the existing parking lot, and perhaps with uh, an adequate barrier wall they could. Um, uh, put their entrance on that side for the cars, utilizing that four-way stop, which controls people taking turns going in and out of the uh, parking, rather than the rather uncontrolled that will be in front of our uh, our units. Uh, 
I tend to support intensification. Uh, if we don't do this, then theoretically the land perhaps could build another OHIP building on it, which is going to have exactly the same effect, whether it's eight stories, 14 stories. Once, it's, uh, once it blocks the sun in the morning, which is five stories, uh, it's not necessarily going to make a big difference. Um, but I, uh, I think the previous gentleman who talked about the impact of parking, the parking study is right now, um, he had a good point about the other buildings that are going up, including the potential 25 story coming after this, uh, along with the homestead, uh, deciding or a parking study would better address um, that total impact to see what it is. Thank you. So we've just crossed uh, 10 questions. I think we'll take a short break here and ask that uh, they, they be answered. And then we will continue on with anybody else who may have any more questions. Great. Thank you for the number of questions that came in. I took notes, but um, <clears throat> if there's anything further. Um, so in terms of the parking, I can provide clarification. So it is a total of 262 parking spaces that are proposed. And so those are comprised of standard parking spaces that would be for the residential tenants of the new building. There would be visitor spaces as well as car share spaces, a loading space. And then there would be a total of 94 parking spaces that would be dedicated to replacing the parking of which the building is to be located on for the exclusive use of the McDonald Cartier building to fulfill lease requirements for long-term parking. And uh, so yeah, to answer the question, yes, the parking that is to be removed is to be replaced and pass holders will be um, provided with a parking space. And alternatives are being explored dur for um, during construction. And uh, uh, looking at the number of trees, uh, as I mentioned, yes, some trees would be removed to facilitate this development, but replacement is anticipated. The uh, existing site is a parking lot, so it is primarily asphalt with limited uh, trees within medians, which have limited uh, capacity to grow further, and will be um, replaced around the perimeter of the building with new trees. Um, I think in terms of compatibility, uh, we have detailed policies within the official plan that speak to land use compatibility, and that criteria is very detailed and very specific, and it's all outlined in the planning justification report that supports the application and is uh, available on DASH. But at a high level, uh, we're looking at multiple compatibility items in terms of uh, matching land use with appropriate um, <clears throat> properties beside each other. We're looking at building mass, we're looking at setbacks, we're looking at shadowing impacts, but we're also looking at um, the impacts of um, other items such as traffic and civil engineering. Um, I would also note uh, there were several comments about subsurface conditions of the property. So further investigation is being done. Uh, a record of site condition will be needed for this property based on the historical use and what is anticipated uh, below grade. So additional uh, phase one and two environmental site assessment is to take place as well as geotechnical study and hydrogeological study as well. And that work um, is to commence uh, shortly. And uh, the four levels of parking. So we are replacing a surface parking lot, and of course there are needs to replace the parking for the McDonald Cartier building, but there are also parking needs for new residents. And so the proposed design is, is one level below grade, and that of course is limited by uh, the proximity to the water and the water table level. But the four levels above, um, the treatment is, is architectural design and the use of 
uh, units along Wellington Street such that you would see them uh, as being ground floor units. There would be people living in them with you know, active streetscapes and individual accesses to the street. Um, and I do uh, appreciate the comments and the supplemental materials that Mr. Purcell has provided. Um, those photos, photos always speak a thousand words. And yes, we're working closely with um, city staff and the review of the stormwater management criteria, the approach to addressing it and hoping to uh, work with them also in terms of identifying um, the existing conditions that we're working with so that anything that's being proposed um, adequately manages uh, the stormwater flows and is uh, uh, not worsening that situation, but hopefully uh, improving upon it. And I think it's a really interesting question. It's been raised more than once about having a traffic study for all of downtown <laughs> to address multiple projects. So unfortunately, the way our planning approvals process works, we're, we're not able to you know, address multiple projects at once. We're looking at the impact of this particular project. Um, and that's the, the, you know, the scope with which we can um, address traffic. But I see Mark putting on, you wanna add a few comments? Sure, you're done? I am. Okay, thanks. So I'll, I'll pick up on that one to where Tess left off with respect to traffic. So um, when traffic studies are done, they do look at future build out conditions as well. And that's based on um, future developments that may happen in the area, estimated growth in an area. So what it's not just that day or you know that year what the traffic is. It does consider the impacts of other developments or other growth that it's anticipated to happen. So the traffic study um, and the city reviews the traffic studies as well to make sure that they're taking into account um, other new development that might happen um, so that it is accurate. So it's not, it's not foolproof in terms of there is another application down the street and you know what exactly the traffic generation from that development is may not be exactly represented in the projections, but it, it does take into account um, future growth and uh, makes assumptions about further activity happening that they that they would have to uh, model as well as part of the traffic study. Um, so just a few other things just to touch on about turtles. So just for clarification, the site currently and in, in, in the future doesn't actually directly abut the water. So there is the waterfront trail that goes between this site and the water and that's anticipated to continue. Um, there will be an increase in green space, landscape space on the site as, as close to the water as it is, or in terms of the, the parts closest to the water. Um, and because it has to go through a site plan process as well, there is an opportunity to some degree, though less so now under new rules um, from the province with respect to site plan limitations. Um, but we can take a look at, you know, what's appropriate landscaping for the, the site um, in terms of uh, the waterfront area. Um, but the city basically controls the area between the water or the immediately the immediate upland area along the water's edge because it's part of the waterfront trail. So it's actually the city who has oversight of, of that space. Um, then with respect to um, you know the size development in the area, suggestions of shorter heights. So as part of the exercise, we did look at three or four different building options, including a nine story, 12 story, 14 story, and 20 story. Um, and so just looked at, you know, what is a similar number of units look like in these different built forms, like a, sh a shorter, more massive building, um, you know, versus a 20 story tower with a podium. And looking at all the different factors, so, so considering heritage, so Parks Canada is concerned about views from the canal uh, from the ESCO World Heritage perspective. Um, and so they provided comments on a height that they would um, prefer, be more supportive of um, with respect to impacts and shadowing. The taller buildings generally cast further shadows, though the, the smaller floor plate of a, of a narrower tower um, has benefits in terms of not having as wide of a shadow. Um, then if you go with a shorter uh, building, you end up with a bigger 
I guess, bigger building, essentially, because you're squishing the same type of unit count into a bigger building. Um, and so that also has a visual impact as well. So the 14 story from a heritage perspective, the heritage consultants and some feedback from Parks Canada, um, as well as uh, from an urban design perspective, the 14 story mid ground was seen as the best kind of compromise of all the three, four options that were looked at before. And we did all this before setting out on a path of writing reports and, and doing the full application package. So there really was a lot of time taken to assess these different options before uh, kind of landing on the 14 story approach as the best of uh, all worlds. Um, and with respect to environmental state, so the property is unfilled land, um, as is you know the townhouses next door, as is a lot of the modern downtown waterfront in Kingston. Um, and there is contamination in the groundwater, the coal tar contamination that basically flows kind of throughout the groundwater in the downtown. So a lot of buildings in the downtown have what's called a risk assessment. So it's basically an abatement program to deal with um, contamination that you can't just physically remove because it's it, as soon as you remove it from one site, it would just, you know, from the groundwater, for example, would flow back into the site the next day in terms of uh, how this particular type of contamination um, works. So, you know, the OHIP building has a risk assessment and risk abatement um, that uh, manages and um, deals with any potential uh, impacts. And so the same would happen here where we actually have to get what's called a record of site condition from the province that says this is how we're handling um, contamination on the site and there's going to be certain requirements about having uh, limited uses on the ground floor, um, having to cap um, uh, the building of the site, for example, with the parking garage, parking structure, um, and that's all required to meet the Ministry of the Environment requirements for sites such as this. Um, and then on a related note, when looking at building on filled land, yes, you have to carefully look at the underlying soils and can it support a large building? And usually the answer is you have to do some interventions with respect to soil replacement. Um, footings have to be designed in a particular way, et cetera. So all that comes at the building permit stage essentially, but it's not terribly unusual in terms of constructing a large building on unfilled land um, in urban areas, particularly older areas of, of urban downtowns. So um, I think that's all, all I had in terms of follow-up. So. Thank you. There was a uh, question about the current density of neighboring units relative to the existing one. Do we have any idea what the density is of, say, Plast Arms per hectare? Go ahead. Thanks, and through you. Oh, that was, sorry, louder than I anticipated it being. Uh, thanks, and through you, Chair. We don't have those numbers tonight, but we've noted the question, so we can take that back with us, get that information, and then provide it to the member of the public. If they just want to see us after this meeting, they can provide us either their contact details being phone or email, and we'll get in touch with them. Thank you. And the other one was concerning the turtle habitat. I appreciate that it's rated by city-owned property, but I think the concern was that turtles would, could travel beyond that and nest during the construction season. Um, is that being taken care of? Yes, just through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, no, good. Second question, I missed that part. Um, so because this is a waterfront, or effectively a waterfront site, it's within the regulated area for the Conservation Authority. Um, so certainly they'll have some requirements with respect to um, how construction is managed. And the city also has their own requirements in terms of, um, for example, just silt fencing, so to keep uh, runoff during storm events during construction from entering the water. So um, there would be fencing erected with respect to construction. Um, there's no specific requirement that I'm aware of for any kind of turtle fencing, but um, I imagine the construction fencing would serve a similar purpose um, in terms of keeping uh, turtles from entering the site because the construction fencing would typically go along the perimeter of the site as well. So that would have the same, I guess, dual purpose. Um, Thank you. And the last question that I heard was concerning the compatibility, and I heard you mention that there was many facets of that, but one in particular that was mentioned and was requested uh, comment on was how is 14 stories compatible with three stories? Yes. So through you, Mr. Chair. So um, really compatibility, you know, the definition of compatibility in the official plan, it doesn't say the same as or equivalent to or the same height, anything like that. It's a list of criteria of can these two uses or multiple uses coexist beside each other or, or 
between each other. Um, and so to, to evaluate that, you look at, okay, is there, are there mitigation measures in place where you have, say, buildings of differing height? And mitigation measures could be separation distances. So is it 14-story building 10 meters away from a three-story building? Um, and in this case, it's not. There's obviously a generous setback between this building and the, and the townhouses. You also think about the context. So in the downtown, unlike in the suburbs, you are gonna have buildings that are closer together. So the expectation that you have more densely populated areas with more densely uh, located, co-located buildings, there's that expectation of what's, you know, what's the range of uses you're gonna get in an urban downtown area. Um, you also look at off-site impacts. So for noise from a larger building, HVAC units, garage venting, all that kind of stuff. So you have to, try, you have to mitigate those things. Um, through site design, so then you, you know, check the box, yes, we're avoiding certain potential impacts that could happen. Um, so that's, that's really that official plan set of policies about is it compatible, and then there's that list that Tess referred to in terms of do you, do you achieve all these things in terms of mitigating potential impacts or um, avoiding creating those impacts altogether through site design, building location, et cetera. So, you know, in this case, that's where we also looked at, you know, the, the three or four different options, 9, 12, 14, 20 stories. And part of the consideration was what's, you know, what's a good compatible height, taking into account all the other aspects that we need to consider too in terms of, you know, from a heritage perspective, reducing the height is seen as preferable, um, even though that might allow us to shrink the building envelope down if we went with a smaller podium tower. Um, so it's a lot of these multiple facets, I guess, feeding into what ultimately is supportable given all the policies in the official plan, so. Thank you. Now we will move on to the second cohort of uh, public comments. If there's anybody else who would like to comment on this, please come on down. And we will follow the same procedure. Um, please give your name and your address, and we will answer all the questions at the end of this cohort. Go ahead. Fantastic, thank you. My name's uh, Joel Thompson. I reside at 882 Clearfield Crescent in Kingston. Um, I think I might be in the minority tonight of people who are in favor of this application. Um, as a city, we are excellent at building large family homes and student-sized apartment buildings for sale and rent. However, as a local realtor, I can speak firsthand at the missing asset class of housing for first-time home buyers and downsizers in our area. My question for clarity tonight is not in regards to the height of the building, but what is the breakdown of the average size of each style of unit? As a city, we have too many empty nesters living in large three to five bedroom homes who have nowhere to downsize into, so they stay in their homes and the opportunity for new young families to move up on the property ladder is lost. We desperately need units that are at least 1,000 square feet that do not come with the price tags associated with buildings like 5 Gore Street for people to downsize into or purchase. Condos are currently the most expensive asset class per square foot in our city. Condos are supposed to be the cheapest asset class because of density and are in every city centre in Ontario outside of Kingston. Additionally, I think everyone around the Horseshoe today has taken one or more vacations to downtown Toronto or Montreal. They all have high-rise buildings and we love visiting these cities for their amazing culture, food, festivals, and most importantly, vibrant downtown. We need to stop saying that we are on the precedent of the destruction of our downtown while vacationing the exact style of cities that we are hoping to build. Lastly, I think it's important to note the developer has an initial application in front of us today, and now the process of technical review will unfold in the future to answer more in-depth questions before a shovel ever gets put in the ground. I would like to thank the applicant for continuing to submit development applications in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Will there be anybody else for this application? Can we check online, please? Yes. For the members on Zoom, thank you for your patience. If you wish to speak, please raise your virtual hand. It's in the bottom middle of your screen. I'm not seeing any movement, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? No. OK, so we will move. Oh, yes. oh sorry. Please, come on down.
My name is Catherine Purcell. I live at 300 Wellington Street. I'd like to respond to your comment, the previous fellow. Uh, I think that we have a vibrant, very much vibrant city right now. We have festivals, we have lots of wonderful food, we have met more restaurants per capita than Toronto. Um, I don't think that these high rises will um, are necessary to do that. But that's not what I came here to say. Uh, my comments tonight are directed to the city. I can understand the developers focusing only on the technical aspects of their buildings, uh, their technical compatibilities. I, I get that, that's their business. What I am disappointed with is that there doesn't seem to be any oversight by the city in terms of the big picture. A lot of effort was put into a city plan that called for low-rise densification. And this seems to have been thrown out without any justification. It accounted for densification, but kept the historical character that makes Kingston great. When did the vision of Kingston change from being proud of our history and focusing, just changing it to being one of another nondescript high-rise city? Thank you. Thank you. Come on down, please. Hi. Um, my name is Martha Vosper. And I live, in, uh, I live on Johnson Street. I've lived much of my life in this city. Um, I note that we have this beautiful picture of our city hall staring at us on these screens. And I want people to remember exactly what that woman just said. I get it that we want a vibrant city. Right now, we've got a crisis in our infrastructure. You bring this many people into the downtown area, especially that corner where you're going into Wellington Street and what's going to happen to the, the, uh, the way in which the traffic is going to flow, it seems, it seems unfortunate to me. I look at the Anna Lane, it's eight stories, it blends in. I was walking the other day and I thought, you know, it's, it's not so bad. But I really think the city has lost its way with regards to these high rises. I've been driving back over the bridge several times in the last week, and it, we can still see these beautiful domes. We can still see certain things, but we're not going to see them forever if we continue to throw away what our, our uh, city fathers have done for this city in trying to protect this, the, the special downtown part. I, I see us developing along Princess Street, have at her. There's lots of places to go develop. But we only have one waterfront, and it is fragile. And I'm not happy with what I'm hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? OK, back to the applicants. Go ahead. So I was just going to, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we have the project architect, I think, here virtually, so I was hoping he could answer the question about average breakdown of um, unit sizes. So, Alistair, I'm not sure if you're able to join. There he is. I am. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. Uh, my name is Alistair Kirkwood. I'm the architect at uh, GSA Studio. Um, with regards to the units, we have a mix of units uh, within this project. Uh, one beds, one plus dens, two beds, and even some threes. Um, I don't actually have a chart of the full breakdown, uh, but I do sort of, as I look at the plans, I could say that the, the one beds are at the sort of 620 square foot range. Uh, one plus dens are probably upwards of six, uh, 660, 675, uh, even into the 700s. Uh, the two bedroom units are probably all over 800. Uh, and then the two plus or the three beds are probably, uh, you know, into the, the 1,000 or 1,100 mark. Okay, thanks, Alistair, that's helpful. Okay. I'm not sure if there's anything else here. I mean, there, there's some overarching, I guess, like broad theme questions about height, density, development in the downtown. Um, and I, I guess I know that 
just from my own experience, I know that the city is intending to do a um, further study of development in the downtown that would look at some of these things and look to um, evaluate the current official plan policies. Um, you know, many of the official plan policies that are in effect uh, have been in effect or carryovers from the old City of Kingston official plan. Um, so rightly or wrongly, they're, they're what's in effect. Um, and so we are seeing pressure with um, housing and intensification and climate change and trying to minimize usage on or usage of the automobile, which points towards trying to intensify in places that can support it um, in terms of places that are walkable um, and that are well supported by services. So I think there is that pressure to have development in places like downtowns. Um, and with, I guess, the costs of development, the size of city lots, et cetera, um, most projects need a certain amount of square footage um, for them to, to work. Um, and so it's hard to put in a lot of density in these downtown locations without um, large floor plates or larger buildings. So again, it's that compromise between, uh, as we went through that exercise of 9, 12, 14, 18, or 20 story buildings, compromise between what do you, what do you get out of a, a really big nine story building um, versus uh, smaller smaller floor plate sizes and taller buildings. Um, and the, the practice, the overarching, I guess, best practice is that there's less impact from smaller floor plate, taller buildings than really squat large uh, buildings. Um, so there is you know, a rhyme and reason to kind of the design direction you're seeing in a lot of, a lot of buildings. Um, and I think there's that tension between maintaining what we have and, and balancing um, new development amongst the old or the original. And so can they coexist and you lose the meaning of you know, the heritage or the character of the area downtown. And that's what these processes that we're going through are intended to try to ensure doesn't happen. That when development is approved, that you're not negatively impacting heritage, that you're trying to make it compatible. And so I'd say the reports that we do, the work that we do, the, the process that we go through is intended to test those proposals and the reports and make sure that the design is compatible and does meet the, the, the tests. And there won't always be agreement on that. Um, and I think that's where it's a continued conversation and I look forward to, you know, the city doing further work, looking at updating policies for the downtown and, and considering the pressures that there are for development in urban areas and in heritage areas. So other than that, thank you for your time and your questions. Thank you. So now we will move over to the committee. But before we start, I'd just like to caution the committee that um, this is a community meeting and you guys have a privileged position in which you can actually ask the entire planning staff your questions through email at any time. So in order not to take away too much time from the next um, proposal, I would ask that if you can ask your questions off or online through the e through email that you do that so that we can give everybody here the best opportunity to present their issues. Having said that, now, are there any questions from the committee? Through you, Mr. Chair. So we have finished the main round of public for the first application. We haven't heard the second application yet. So if you were uh, interested about the, let me just scroll up to the top of my notes here. Uh, the 279 Wellington Street and 49 Plast Arms, we have closed the public section as we're now on the uh, committee questions. Uh, but like I said, we have not yet discussed the, uh, and have not seen the applicant presentation for the 64 Barrick and 235 to 237 Wellington Street. Um, in addition, um, you can send me a note or a message uh, with your public comments and we'll get them to the planners as well as, as, as more so for the applicant to hear public feedback right now. Sir, if you would like to come up to the speaker platform there and give you your name and your address, I'll be able to record you for the minutes. Thank you. That sounds good. Go ahead. Uh, Robert McKenzie, one plus arm.
My uh, first uh, matter concerns the, uh, what's above the 14th level. Uh, why is it proposed that such a large area of the roof uh, be taken by a service uh, facility of some sort? And uh, why does it have to be about the equivalent of two stories high? Sorry, sir. What we're going to do is going to have you ask all your questions and make your comments all at once, so then the applicant can reply to them all at once as well. So if you have additional comments and questions, please ask them now. I'm sorry. I feel my opportunity to be heard is being restricted. I like a specific question that can be replied specifically. I'll go on to my next specific question. I don't want my questions to become lost as a bundle. They won't be lost, sir. You're the only one speaking at this moment. Please ask your questions. Thank you. I'm also concerned about the facade of uh, this proposal uh, at the ground level. It seems to me uh, facades are important and uh, part of the area of the ground floor level of the building, building of uh, ground floors, uh, will be occupied by a parking facility. I think the facade of the parking facility leaves a lot to be desired. It seems to be minimum thought when it went into how to treat the facade of the parking facility. It seems to me facades are important. They represent the interface between what happens inside the building and outside of the environment. And how has this proposal come to its proposal minimum proposal with respect to the facade around the parking garage area. It seems like facades are important, uh, like uh, clothes that people wear. Clothing represents the interface between the human body and what's appropriate for the presence of that human body in the environment. Same goes for the building. I'd like to ex hear the explanation for what was the consideration for what was shown in the perspectives for the facade of the garage. <clears throat> now, at the lower level, at the podium level, uh, this is uh, the level that uh, people in the area will take in will, within their visual range. It's important that, that the lower part of the building, the podium, take that into account. Uh, it seems to me the uh, uh, this is not a friendly podium. Uh, a use that typically uh, is put at ground level is the disposal of waste. Uh, how is it proposal to, proposed to pr provide for the disposal of waste? Typically, uh, waste disposal is not put on the front of the building. Usually, it's down the side or at the rear of a service lane. 30 I'm seconds, sir. Pardon? 30 seconds left Thank on you. your time. How is it proposed to deal with waste disposal so as to minimize its effect on the environment at the ground level. 
Thank you. Thank you. To the applicants, go ahead. All right, so through you, Mr. Chair, I'll actually ask the architect to speak to both the height of the mechanical floor and the size of it, as well as the comments, concerns about the facade and the uh, how garbage will be dealt with uh, within the site and in the building. So, Alistair. Hi there. Um, with regards to the mechanical space or the mechanical penthouse on top of the building, um, there is two factors at play. One is the minimum height required for the mechanical equipment. Uh, in every building I've ever worked on, it's a minimum of 14 feet clear. Uh, the second is the elevator overrun. Now we are proposing to take the elevator to the rooftop, which then obviously the elevator must have an overrun above that. Um, the reason we are taking the elevator to the rooftop is that we hope to have some outdoor amenity space, just a terrace on the rooftop. Um, the size of the actual footprint of the mechanical penthouse uh, is still under some review and it has been, it is being discussed with the city. Uh, my preference is to have all of the equipment enclosed within the penthouse itself. Um, we could reduce the penthouse, but that would mean that a lot of the equipment is then sitting outside on the roof and would have potentially metal screens or, uh, or sometimes even no screens. They're never high enough. Um, so that's why the size of the mechanical penthouse may look a little larger than some of the older buildings. Now, the older buildings often have um, mechanical equipment in the basement, whereas all of ours, the majority of ours, is on the rooftop. Um, I'm going to jump to the the waste disposal. There is um, a garbage chute, recycling chute, uh, within the building itself. All of the garbage, recycling, and potentially organics will be collected at the lower level within a garbage room um, with a tri-sorter type machine. All of that loading occurs within the building at the rear of the building. Um, the garbage truck will drive in, uh, the recycling truck will drive in and it will load, or it will, obviously it will, it will load itself up, it will unload the garbage bins. Uh, there's no intention for these bins or uh, to be brought out uh, and, and sitting in the driveway or sitting at the side of the building. It is all internal within the building itself. Um, now, for the facade of the... Uh, I'm a little confused with the comment about the facade of the parking levels and then the discussion of the podium. Because the podium is the parking levels. And... We have actually taken, I agree, there was other comments earlier where we, there was discussion about, uh, you know, above grade parking garages can look quite horrific. Uh, they're open, you see the, the lights of the cars at night moving around. We have taken care to try and present that podium as an enclosed building. Uh, it, we we're proposing some stone and brick uh, along with windows, which would be allow some natural light, but also would be muted uh, and higher at elevation, so that the, the the headlights of the cars would not, you know, shine out into the neighborhood. Um, and there's a lot of detail on that uh, brick and stone work. It has a, a slightly industrial look to it, um, which I think is in keeping with sort of that downtown Kingston look, that kind of that that rustic stone. Um, in fact, I mean, one of the images that we were showing in our, in our uh, application was, was some of the buildings adjacent uh, and trying to pick up on that same kind of detailing and, and level of, well, level of detailing, because you're right, that is what you see as you walk past the building. Um, so it's not going to be just a flat facade. Um, it will have all the extra detail. And there's no point putting extra detailing 20 stories up. You can't see it, but you can see it at the ground level at the third floor level. Also along the street, we've proposed um, live work units, which uh, there's three of them, um, sort of one bedroom or you know potentially two bedroom units, which have a separate door into an office space. So, um, you know, an accountant or a lawyer, some kind of a professional might want to live there and then have their office right next door. So there will be activity there. You're not going to see a parking lot, you're going to see an active frontage on the street. Um, I'm not sure if that uh, answers the question. I hope it answers the question. I'm not sure if I can share images or, or not whether it's worth to do that. But I think, um, I think that's the three questions, isn't it? 
Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. I think that, that answers them. Thank you. Thank you. So now back to the committee. Oh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, please I give just, your name and your address, yes, and you have five going, minutes. I was just going to give it, yeah. My name is Jane Oldfield. I live at 268 Wellington Street. And I just, I'll keep it short, because I know, you know, we've talked about this. But I think, first of all, I'm listening to all this public meeting here tonight. I want to know, is this a done deal with this? You know, I know we're here to state our points of view and everything, and there's a lot of people here that are, we're really disappointed with what is happening in the downtown core. I want to know if we have any say here, if we really, really have any say. And I think that's a really important point to note of where we're going, because often things happen in this city. We have a bus stop right outside our door. We had no idea that it was even going to be there. And things happen. There's water that I have listened to come down the street from, Welling, from Princess Street all the way down in front of my beautiful restored limestone house. And I, at my expense, our expense, have had to pay for different, um, you know, um, what is it? Um, septic systems, yes. Sump pumps, I'm sorry. Don't mind me, I'm a bit nervous here. Um, but anyway, we've had to actually do that. And I've watched the water just ooze down, all down Wellington Street. And I don't think anyone has really, really looked at, you know, just the land that we're talking about here. I don't think it's going to hold it either. I think it's just going to be a huge issue that way. And the other thing that I really do want to point out, and I really want to say this for the city of Kingston, and I hear this every single day, downtown and Princess Street, getting towards our area, even on Wellington Street, it's an absolute disgrace with the homeless people. And I think everyone says, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do with them? But I don't know how many people are gonna be living downtown if we keep this up. It's awful what's happening down here. Things are stolen from doors, people are stealing, stealing carts. No one's doing anything about it in this city. And it's a disgrace. So who wants to be in a big, beautiful high rise when you see people all around just stealing things and strung out in drugs? I love my downtown house. I'm considering moving because I can't stand it. And sorry I'm emotional about it, but we have to think about this with our city. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public? This is your last opportunity to speak at this particular meeting. Can I speak again? No, you've had your five minutes. If you wish to add more, you can send an email or a letter to the city. Is there anyone else? Going once. Going twice. Opportunity gone. Okay, if you do have anything or you come to come to something else that comes to mind, please send an email to the clerk or the planner or the director of planning, and uh, they will get back to you with more detailed answers. Yeah, and I just want to quickly say, just so to say it out loud, my email is isullivan at cityofkingston.ca, um, Sullivan, S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N. It's also on the city website for the planning committee, and I will happily forward anything I receive to the planning services as well. Thank you. And to answer your primary question, no, this is not a done deal. We will be listening and taking into account everything that you say and trying to adapt to it. Thank you. From the committee. Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, I do have some questions. I can bring boring questions to staff with email, but I work at McDonald Cartier building. I've worked there for 14 years, so I know this area very well. And uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Purcell for sending the photos um, of the flooding because I was at work um, the one time that Wellington Street looked exactly like those pictures 
um, that we have in the adids. And yeah, August 15th, 2018. And we couldn't believe it when we looked outside and, uh, and saw that flooding. So um, Wellington Street and Plastarm, that area, they do have water issues. Uh, for sure. Um, I want to ask the applicant just to verify these are apartments and not condos. Is that correct? And if they are apartments, um, do we have any opportunity to make some of the units into affordable units, RGI? Um, can that be given consideration? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, at this time, my understanding is that they're intended to be condos, but with the change federal government um, and pr potentially provincial government with respect to taxation changes for rental. Um, I haven't heard anything specifically from the owner, but um, I'll get back to you uh, about that as well as with respect to any uh, affordability um, elements to any of the units. I don't know beyond that at this point, though. Um, your, your comment about flooding, I meant to bring it up in answer to some of the other questions and certainly the last resident. Um, so originally the plan looked at for stormwater and grading on the site did look at um, as is often the case directing runoff to city streets and storm sewers um, we've become aware certainly that there's some local issues um, quite severe and we've done some additional work since the original plan was done we've talked to uh, city staff obviously um, uh, mr purcell um, in a meeting at our office um, and so we have started to revamp the design with respect to stormwater um, to retain more on site and also to direct uh, uh, cleaned water into uh, the river, which is also an, an, another common approach on waterfront sites is if you treat the water on site and then you can release um, uh, treated water into the, to the water body. So that would mean that we're pushing, instead of having water go on to Wellington, we're actually directing water off the site into um, into the water body. So we are aware of con those concerns, and we're actively working to to change the plan to address those. So. Thank you. Um, with your comment that <laughs> they're going to be condos, yeah, with the HXST exemption now that the uh, federal and provincial governments are offering, I hope you reconsider because it's apartment rentals that we really need the most in Kingston uh, right now. Um, okay, we just talked about flooding. I also want to verify Leslie from Turtles Kingston um, about the nesting sites. So yeah, the turtles are coming from the water, but they have um, nested about nine, nine different nests right around the McDonald Karche building. And uh, you wouldn't think that these turtles would go through this gigantic, you know, Anglin and MCB parking lot, but they do, and they cross over Wellington Street as well. And so um, during the construction, like I'm hoping that maybe then with the apart with the condo apartment building, you could create an artificial nesting mound of just, you know, sand, stones, like consult with Turtles Kingston, if that could go in the minutes for the applicant to consult with Turtles Kingston so that uh, they don't get smushed by all the construction vehicles um, as well as, uh, you know, um, since you are going to be doing a little bit of landscaping uh, for the apartment dwellers, you know, like maybe um, like one of those artificial turtle mounds can stay there permanently. So uh, because that is where they go every single year, nine nesting sites, I get all the emails uh, from my coworkers. There's 600 people that work at the McDonald Cartier building. So lots of eyes, they come to me and then I've been going to Leslie. So um, that is true. Uh, and uh, let's see, we talked about 14 stories. Um, has Parks Canada given their, um, like their, their opinion or are, are we still waiting? Like 14 stories, is that okay for the UNESCO heritage destination that the uh, Inner Harbor Rideau Canal has? So through, you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'll answer the two questions about turtle nesting. So we'll make note of that. The landscaping plan is just conceptual at this point. So I think good to hear about that. And I know from my own experience in my own yard, which is 
close to a wetland, but far enough away, the turtles will make a, a long hike to, to nest in the usual location. So good to know about nesting even up around the building. Um, so that's certainly something that we can take into account. Um, and I know the landscape architect on this project has been involved with uh, dealing with turtle nesting habitat, et cetera, and others. So he has some, some experience with that. So that's good to know. Um, with respect to um, Parks Canada's comments, so as part of that pre-consult or you know, pre-development work that we did looking at different building options and heights, um, we took that information um, and had meetings with Parks Canada or had a meeting with Parks Canada um, before we decided on a building direction to go in. Um, and then they provided comments to staff as part of the uh, city uh, cir technical circulation uh, process. And so that, that letter I think is, is available. Um, and they are supportive of the, the height. I mean, their, their perspective is really kind of focused on, you know, height and view of, um, view from the canal. So they don't necessarily get into the nitty gritty, but in terms of the height, um, they seem to be supportive of the 14 stories, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, just going on to the tree inventory and, uh, Thank you for saving the trees around the McDonald Cartier building, but um, I do know that, yeah, those honey locusts have to go, but I do want to make note of um, tree number 1234 in the tree preservation plan because those, those four trees are on the outer edge. Um, what happened was many years ago, we had gorgeous ash trees all the way around between the MCB parking lot and Anklin parking lot, but they were ash trees. They had to be cut down. Lay Poldings then planted some new trees, and out of the uh, 13 new trees they planted, like there's only like four or five trees that survived. We were hand watering them for three years um, at lunchtime using water water out of um, Anglin Bay there and so like tree number one and three and four like they are 10 inches dbh and it looks like it's going to be on the far outer side so if we could in any way keep those trees um, that would be great and I know that even one or two of those four trees and I know that too um, those uh, white spruce trees th 13 14 and 15 even if we could just keep one of those, you know, I don't know if it's possible, but um, rather than just cutting all the trees down in that parking lot area, um, that would be appreciated for that. And uh, yeah, and when you do replant any of the trees for the new condo apartment, um, what Lee Podings did around those of, um, honey locusts is that they put asphalt almost all the way up to the tree trunk. So if we could not do that, um, you know, as part of the landscaping plan, that would be great for the trees that will be planted in its place. And also if there could be some sort of um, underground water, um, water system, irrigation system to water the trees to give them their best survival, um, that would be appreciated, even though like council doesn't give the final approval for landscaping plans anymore due to uh, Bill 23. So that's the point I just want for the minutes. With that, Mr. Chair, um, uh, for the parking lot itself, I just have a question to the applicant if there's going to be any um, electric vehicle parking infrastructure provided. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, electric vehicle parking roughens are anticipated within the building. Given that it's very preliminary design at this point, we don't have a confirmed number of dedicated EV spaces, but it is certainly something that we're, we're looking at for the proposal. Thank you very much, and for you, Mr. Chair. Um, during the construction, um, I understand from the community meeting that you held, um, my coworkers uh, reported back that off-site parking, um, you know, that, of, of that's going to be affected, uh, will try to be provided. Um, I just wondered for the people that park at the England parking lot, uh, are they going to be affected during the construction? Is there still going to be enough parking for the people at England, or will they also be forced to uh, park elsewhere? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. I, I know it's of uh, great concern uh, to have access to 
paid parking downtown, paid in the sense that uh, it's permitted parking. So um, it's very early. I just want to stress that we're very early in a, in a planning approvals process. So um, these are absolutely considerations that are top of mind for, for future arrangements when it does come time to construction. Um, I don't have the details yet in terms of how uh, the parking spaces will be accommodated on other properties, um, but it is something that we're looking at to make arrangements. And Mark wanted to add something. I was just, just to add to that, and the owner of this development, or the proponent of this development is the owner of the building, and, and you know they are concerned about the providing parking for existing tenants, so they have taken the steps, and staff have provided contacts um, within uh, the city um, for staff who oversee the parking lots downtown to look at opportunities to share parking, to um, have temporary offsite parking when the time comes. So, um, yeah, we're, that's hopefully going to be taken care of. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I just have two more questions. Um, my next question is, where will the um, construction staging area be? Is that going to be the England parking lot? Yeah, as Tess said, probably pretty early to say, but I think the contemplation is that during construction, um, that would be, you know, the parking lot is there, the existing service parking lot, part of it's not going to be disturbed. Um, so construction staging would likely be on site, but it would have to be um, done appropriately to make sure that there's still adequate parking for the existing building. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> So my last question then is just about a letter that we received tonight um, by email. I believe we got it by email. It might be in the adids. And um, that's how, okay, so we're, part, we're building this 14-story building, like close to the water, and that's a privilege like we talked about. And Kingston is a major flyway for migrating birds. So I just want consideration to be in the minutes that we follow the City of Toronto best practice glass and try to use um, bird safe glass for this. Um, I know at MCB during the migrate, migratory um, periods, uh, they have blinds, Venetian blinds, and they keep the blinds drawn um, at nighttime now to, and that's only a five story building. So this is gonna be like three times the height. And uh, my other, um, point two is hearing about the terrace, right? Like the top, the, like the 15th level, which will be mechanical penthouse and terrace. You know, um, we have to worry too about the lights, you know, like try to dim the lights so that they're not, um, <laughs> you can't see them so much from the outside, uh, you know, because birds, as in our letter, um, and the, what the KFN will tell you are that the birds are attracted to spotlights. And that also goes for the top of the mechanical um, penthouse, is that, like, let's make sure we don't have spotlights on the top at all. We'll just have, like, the red lights, you know, to warn any, uh, like, drones and, uh, and airplanes. But uh, uh, it's major disaster when you put spotlights up there. We lost millions of birds in the 1980s when um, the gas treatment plant or the gas energy plant out uh, Bath Road near in Bath, uh, close to Napanee, when they had spotlights on the huge um, uh, silos there, all these birds crashed into it, and now they just have the red lights at the top, and I don't want to see the same fate for this apartment, and it will also be very important for our next meeting, which is, is proposed to be like 25 stories. Thank you. So there's three, Mr. Chair, on that one. Sorry, I'll just say with respect to the... So this, um, if, you, if you recall the grain elevator site, there's a similar concern, and it, the developer there um, agreed to implement the Toronto City of Toronto uh, bird-friendly guidelines with respect to glass. And so the same uh, same development partners here. Um, so probably I can't commit to anything, obviously, but probably a good sign with respect to that. Thank you, um, Councillor Glenn. Go ahead. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I won't be repetitive. Thank you, Councillor Osanek, for asking uh, uh, all of those great questions <laughs> and uh, covering much of the territory I had hoped to cover. I do want to reiterate the concerns about uh, condos versus apartments. 
and the environmental concerns that have been expressed by many around here. Um, I am concerned about the height, and we do have to build uh, more housing and taller, but there is a spot for all of this. Uh, and I know that what we're being told right now is that these uh, gradual setbacks um, are going to be better than building a shorter squatter building. Um, and that your concern is being able to afford it. So maybe a question about what is it that's driving the unaffordability of being able to build a shorter building? And um, then my sort of second question, because as I said, I'm not going to belabor the other points that have already been made. Um, I'm going to speak to aesthetics, and we as a city unfortunately have very little control over it. But when I look at this building, what I do see is something to me that looks like Lego blocks stacked on one another, and that's probably one of the primary concerns that you're actually hearing but nobody's expressing in such a blunt way. Um, it is a historic city, and when we build things that are not in character, that do not add to the sense of place, uh, then we do change the city. Yes, I love going to Toronto. I love going to Montreal. I think the tall buildings are great. But I also remember downtown when you could see the Royal York and you can't see it now. It's buried. So I think it's a very legitimate concern and I hope that you'll give consideration for that in your proposal moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the committee? Oh, sorry. Did you wish to answer that? Sure, as much as I can. Um, so I guess with respect to co cost uh, or financial implications of going lower, smaller, um, you know, this question often comes up and, and under the Planning Act, I guess financial feasibility is, no, is not something that I as a planner can, can speak to, I guess, and, and I, I, I'm not privy to, I guess, on any of these projects, financials, as to what's affordable or what's feasible or what's not. Um, I guess I would just say that there are, um, when projects are financed through banks or other lenders, they are looking for a certain, um, uh, certain number, I guess. So if you go to a bank and you're trying to finance construction projects, they're looking for certain minimums. And so projects are always at least stuck to that minimum from wherever the financiers are, are looking for. Um, so that's really where you kind of get into these at least minimum um, sizes, GFAs, wherever it is. And then sites, sites such as this, and certainly any downtown site, for example, is more costly to develop generally than a greenfield site. For example, on this site, because of the historic fill, construction costs will be greater than a greenfield site, um, even costs for staging, all those kinds of things. But there's obviously a flip side where a downtown site's probably going to be more uh, yield higher rents or sales than a greenfield site. So um, really, I guess, the, from the developer's perspective, they're trying to provide something that is support, or propose something that's supportable um, and that also is financially viable. So they, they won't push for something that, you know, one of the reasons, I guess maybe the way to put it, like one of the reasons we backed off from or we didn't go any further with the 20-story building is because we thought that the height at 20 stories, although it meant for a smaller building and maybe uh, slender, um, it the overall height seemed to be more problematic there. Um, and so going to a lower building does provide certain advantages, um, but you still keep the same number of units. And that's that minimum unit count that typically is what drives okay, we need a certain amount of GFA to make this work. How, how best can we position this so that it, it checks as many boxes as possible in terms of compatibility, heritage, um, aesthetics, et cetera? So again, it's the best partial answer I can give you on, on why we ended up with the size that we were at, I guess. Um, and with respect to aesthetics, I mean, Alistair's the architect, he's, he's done a lot of um, a lot of these types of buildings, and we were informed by the heritage consultant who's looking at this from a, um, you know, the heritage context across the street. There are designated buildings across the street. So obviously UNESCO, um, and so there is a bit of a rhyme and reason to how the building, what you see in the images, how we got there. Um, but we're certainly not tied, I think, to, to anything. So if there are specific suggestions or comments from the public or yourselves, as to what you'd like to see, then you know, happy to receive those um, and try to try to get, integrate them as best as possible. So, yeah. 
Thank you. Anyone else from the committee? Councillor Shaves, go ahead. Thank you. Um, one of my questions was already asked uh, in regard to EV parking. Um, the rest of my questions are in regards to green measures being taken in this development. Um, I know it's multi residential unit, but uh, further than that, such as uh, green roof, geothermal heating, and any other measures may be taken to reduce GHGs within the, the building itself. Thank you. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, just reiterating that it is very early in the process in terms of the building's final design, but that is uh, another matter that we are looking at in terms of sustainability measures. And um, we're investigating use of various sustainable materials such as solar cladding and geothermal systems. But again, the details, um, I certainly can't commit tonight and they, they haven't been confirmed. But I would also add that um, standard energy efficient systems will be implemented as well, things such as LED, low flow water fixtures, energy saving appliances. Um, any of those uh, items are certainly um, a cost saving but also a sustainability measure we're considering as well. Okay, thank you. I just didn't think that, uh, it's not sure to think about those things. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I would like to welcome a special guest, the district councillor, Councillor Ridge. Um, if you have any questions that can be answered through email, I would request that you do that through email. If you have any comments or suggestions for the um, developer, uh, please present them now. Uh, hello, um, yeah, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much uh, for recognizing me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. So my questions are, or I've already heard one of them, which I wanted to touch upon, which is the traffic study piece. Um, so it's kind of a unique situation with many proposed developments uh, coming up in the same area simultaneously. Um, so I just wanted to ensure that traffic studies or reports moving forward will hopefully take into account this. I know it was touched upon briefly earlier, but I was, uh, I was putting my, my son to bed. Um, so that was, that was the first piece because uh, of course, um, I, my, one of my primary concerns about this, these developments going up all at the same time is um, the effect of traffic, uh, traffic safety and pedestrian safety, of course. So that's my first comment slash potential question in terms of what can be done moving forward. Uh, the second piece is a, a question about sight lines, uh, and which was mentioned about uh, sight lines for the waterfront. Um, and this this could be relevant both to this presentation and to the following one. I was wondering if somebody could answer my questions about what sight lines are protected within the city, what measures are taken to protect them, and are any of the protected sight lines affected by this specific development? Just through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the there is one identified protected site, uh, our view point, I think it's called, um, which is down, um, oh, sorry, the cross street, Bay Street. Um, and it's uh, not affected by this view. So just, uh, and I believe it is modeled in one of the images in the urban design or heritage studies. Um, so because Bay Street is a straight shot um, to the water, um, and this site actually curves around a little bit. Um, the view protected corridor down Bay Street isn't affected or isn't being blocked by this view. So. And yet, I mean, the other more general view, I guess you would say is, um, though not specifically identified as a view, is the view from the canal. Um, and so that's part, part and partial of Parks Canada's review and, and as well as city staff's view, uh, review of um, the view broadly speaking, from the canal. So that was also part of the assessment. Okay, thank you very much. And um, if, I, I suppose the traffic study piece is more of a, a coordination of staff effort in this case, so I'll follow up with them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the end of the first committee meeting, community meeting, and uh, we will close that. And now we will open the second community meeting.
for 64 Barrack Street and 235 to 237 Wellington Street. So if we can have the applicant's presentation, that would be a great start. Please, yes, thank you. Mr. Keene, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Committee, staff, and members of the public both joining us uh, in the room tonight and online. My name is Mike Keane, and I'm a land use planner with FOTEN Consultants, and I'm joined by a number of members of our team. I've got my, my colleague, Miles Weeks, who's also a land use planner. The ownership group is represented and in the room this evening. And online, there are representatives from Innate Development, uh, one of the owner uh, representative groups, as well as the Architects SRM. And in particular, assisting me with questions if necessary, you will hear tonight from Mark Vilmer and Jeff Atkinson, who are, who are part of the primary development team. So this evening, we're here to speak about 64 Barrack Street, the Good Life uh, property in downtown Kingston for a proposed zoning bylaw amendment. This site is centrally located in the downtown on the northeast corner of the site. Uh, great proximity to the downtown active life, parks, transit, and all of Kingston's amenities that Kingston has to offer. And zooming in more specifically on the property itself, You'll, you'll know the site as a three-story commercial building with the primary user being the Good Life Fitness Center. The site's uh, 1,700 square meters in size and it has frontage on both Wellington and Barrack Streets uh, across the street from the parking lot of the, the Food Basics and in close proximity to the Leon Center. Looking at the surrounding uh, building fabric in downtown, this is a, a city image that shows existing buildings. And an architect brought this, this thought to me many years ago as an architect working outside of Kingston. And he said, there's, there's these missing teeth in the north end uh, of the downtown, which is really from Queen Street and beyond. And, and I would propose to you that's the reason you are seeing so many development proposals in this area of downtown is to fill those, those missing spaces back in. So in looking more closely at the downtown, I've color coded this in a few different ways with the, with the red being the more historically established downtown portions. You can see our site in the red box in the center of the screen the lower density residential neighborhood off to the northwest of the site. And the, the orange boxes on the site represent development applications that are, are both uh, proposed or approved. The two southern ones being the homestead proposals that are uh, under construction, one site being staged for the other. And obviously the orange site to the north uh, is the site you just heard about this evening from, from my colleagues at Arcadis. Looking at this site, you know, from a 3D perspective, looking down Queen Street, you can see the two homestead buildings and you can see the other building in the distance with ours in the, the center uh, of the image. Just giving you a sense of how this area is, is going to change uh, in the near future by a series of, of development proposals. And I want to speak to you on, on why that is the case. And Canada crested a mark on June 16th of this year. We, we exceeded 40 uh, million people uh, in the country. And in 2022, Canada received 437 and 120 uh, permanent residents to Canada, of which 184,000, more than 184,000, made home in Ontario. So in two, 2022, 
that's almost 43% of all immigrants landed in Ontario. The federal government has plans that continue to see and desire this kind of immigration to Canada, on average 500,000 a year, and numbers are already showing for 2023 that they're going to exceed those numbers. So Canada is in a phase of growth in combination with housing challenges. And so we're seeing the response from the province, who largely dictates policy in this country, or rather in this province, and we're seeing that through renewed provincial policy um, that we expect to be dropped on us this fall. And there is a renewed focus on growth, housing and economic development. And over the past few years, we've seen a number of different acts and changes to policy and, and how municipalities will need to respond to that policy. Uh, Kingston's own targets are 8,000 new homes by, by 2031. And recent, uh, recent news would demonstrate that that number is likely too low, not just for Kingston, uh, but province-wide. So that is setting the basis for why you're seeing large and regular development applications in the downtown of the city of Kingston, which is the hub of the city. It's absolutely the most historically important part of the city, but it's also the place where we need to inject a lot of people and help sustain those businesses. So in looking at the official plan, it is designated a special policy area, and it has been for a number of years. Even since pre-amalgamation, this quadrant of the downtown has been recognized as an area that is going to intensify. And so the official plan encourages the development of these lands, arguably not knowing just how intense development might be because these policies are actually getting quite old. Looking at the official plan policy again, this is a map that shows kind of a breakdown of the different uses that exist in the downtown quadrant. And you can see the 64 barracks site uh, roughly in the center of the screen on the, on the north side. And those, those orange lines represent areas that require uh, commercial frontages. And you can see some distinct colors which are distinguishing uh, some of the uses in the downtown. In looking at the, the view, uh, the, the official plan view schedule, there are a few key points to point out in this area of the downtown and particularly for this site. So this site is not within one of the city's defined heritage character areas. It is also not adjacent to an, a protected area and it is not within uh, the view corridors that go to the lake, nor is it within the view corridors that go to City Hall. So this area of the downtown, and it's not exclusive to this site, but it, but it is unique in that there is, you're on the edge of the most important heritage parts of the downtown, and that's what's going to allow taller and more intense buildings to occur in this area. Looking at the zoning bylaw, many of you may know that the city passed a new zoning bylaw a year ago, but in doing so, there were five former bylaws with a significant number of site-specific zones that had been improved over a 40-plus year period of time, and many of those old site-specific zones held in place through that new zoning bylaw approval. So in this case, we have a zone uh, that falls under the old downtown and harbor bylaw that was responding to that special policy recognizing this area uh, in the downtown as a place where development uh, would occur. Our proposal is to bring this site into the new uh, zoning bylaw and develop specific performance standards to regulate the building. And looking now at the actual proposal that's before this committee, we are proposing a 25-story building. And I know the question will be asked, why 25 stories? You know, today, this is the tallest building proposal in front of the city. I promise you it won't be tomorrow. This is, this is the size of buildings that you're going to see proposed in downtown Kingston, and particularly in this area, because it's an area where we are dealing with a lot of parking lots, we are dealing with an area that can sustain tall buildings with minimal impacts on surrounding uses. This building will have proposed to have 287 
uh, units, and I'll, I'll break the details down on the next slide, and it will have, have parking um, at a ratio that meets the zoning bylaw, the new zoning bylaw, which is a ratio of 0 0.4 uh, spaces per unit, and it will have ground floor commercial on both street frontages, both on Wellington and Barrick Street. So looking closer at the unit breakdown, you know, today, today we're, we're proposing this building would be a condominium, but that's not locked in, in, in any way, particularly as the province continues to change and offer incentives for different forms of building. So as much as the proposed actual structure would not change, the tenure has not been decided for this building at this time. So in terms of the unit breakdown, there is a decent mix of units. As you can see, 89 one-bedroom units, 92 one-bedrooms plus dens, which give you the opportunity to also use that den as a second bedroom, and 105 of the units are two-bedroom units plus den, which gives you that option to have that den as, as a third bedroom, and only just due to the shape of the building, one specific unit that would classify as a solid uh, three-bedroom unit. Right now, the parking is proposed underground. That could change through some of the things you heard with the other application with flooding and, and as we proceed through the technical comments. So, so ultimately, we will meet those minimum zoning uh, parking requirements of 0.4 spaces per, per unit, or, or at least we are striving for that. We are providing the required uh, bicycle parking and, and will likely exceed that requirement the amenity space uh, will similarly exceed the requirement. And one of the other key points of this, this development in comparing the, the proposed form to the existing built form is that we're proposing to pull the building back from the streets um, by, by two to three meters, which will increase that, that street interface where the current building is, is right up to the street line, uh, particularly along Wellington. So there are significant ground level improvements uh, that would would occur through development at this site. And there's, there's the existing building, which is certainly stepped back from Barrick, but directly abutting uh, Wellington with, with minimal uh, interaction along that street face. So just walk you through some of the renderings of the, of the building. This would be a view of the, the close-up street uh, from, from a nighttime perspective, looking down the corner of, of the two streets. Next picture is, is moving into, into a daytime photo, and you, and you can see the, you know, the pullback from the streets. You can see some of the architectural features like the location of the canopies to just, just give your eye that, that street level look um, of, a, of the commercial uses. Looking at the same view uh, from a nighttime perspective, I give you a sense of, of the building uh, from that different view. So as I mentioned, there's a site-specific zoning bylaw amendment proposed, and the plan is to uh, bring the zone into what's called a, a downtown one zone. And the, the uses in this zone are very broad, so we would not be proposing to change any of those uses, but we would need to bring in site-specific provisions to address uh, the, the, the building height uh, and the density of the site. We'd remove those old angular planes from the, from the uh, former zoning bylaw, and we would also decrease the old zoning bylaw parking requirements and bring them in line with the new zoning bylaw. So I have a number of other slides I can, I can bring up as we discuss this project further, but in my opinion, this is good land use planning. This is, this is an opportunity to bring the site within the new zoning bylaw. It's an opportunity to bring new housing to downtown. It's consistent with provincial policy statement of today, and it's most certainly consistent with provincial policy direction that is upcoming and underway, and it will provide a positive contribution and vitality to the central business district, and I'm pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. So let's begin with the public. You have five minutes. We'd ask you to give your name and your address, and we will answer all the questions at the end of all the questions that are asked. Thank you. Go ahead. Once again, my name is uh, Robert Oldfield. I live at 268 Wellington Street. 
I've lived there, worked in that area for about 43 years, so I know I've seen a lot of things happen in this area. Most of them for the better, but this is not for the better, this, this particular development. Um, I, first of all, I'm not anti-development. I know that we have to do some develop in the North Block, but it has to be intelligent, well, well thought out development. It's got to, it's got to coordinate with our historical nature of our, of our city. We're not Toronto, we're not Montreal, we are Kingston. I knew when those two massive buildings by Homestead were approved that this was gonna happen, we were gonna get more of this stuff coming and I see it happening right away. Uh, I listened to the virtual presentation given by Michael and uh, Mark uh, with uh, Innate Development on September the 6th. The massive 25 story building will impact us directly at 268 Wellington Street. Uh, we will be in the shadow of that building for a number of hours uh, through the day. But beyond that, I'm concerned about the direct, the direct impact on our whole neighborhood on Wellington, Barrick, and Rideau Street. After listening to Michael uh, Fontaine and Mark, I have some real concerns. Um, this building is gonna sit on a 1,708 square meter square, basically the Good Life uh, building. That is way too small for a 25 story structure. I disagree that it is adequate. I disagree vehemently. Other people in the area have made a comment when I've given them this details. A lot of people don't realize until I describe what's gonna happen and they go, oh my God, that's, that's incredible. This will be the tallest building in Kingston on a postage stamp lot. I remember I asked Mike during the September the 6th presentation, I said, Mike, Michael, why 25 stories? And his answer was, well, why not 35? In other words, he did not give me an answer, he basically ducked the question. And you alluded just a minute ago to, this is not gonna be the tallest building in Kingston going forward. Well, I think it's up to the city of Kingston to make sure that that does not happen. This is a historical city, our tourism, is based on history. Uh, it's one of the oldest cities in Canada. We cannot let that happen. Also, 287 units, 119 parking spots. Wow. There's gonna be no low cost housing in this particular development. So the people who are gonna be moving in here are gonna be people who can afford a car. They're not gonna be people who can't afford a car. Where are they gonna park? I don't know. Mark Villamer, who's the lead architect on the project, he spoke to the actual design of the building. The key, the key statement that he made that really sat with me was he said, well, it's not so much about the tower, 25 stories, as it is about the podium, which is three stories. There's only a three meter setback. That's nine feet. That's like from me to, me to Mike right there. That's nine feet. And I'm sorry. It will not be about the podium. It will be about a 25 story massive building that's gonna stare at you right in the face. I've also found out just that sight line, this, this sight line thing only applies to uh, public and historical buildings. There are no sight line or visual intrusions that are allowed for private citizens such as ourselves. Uh, the other thing I have a concern with is the traffic. Uh, traffic. I've received the two traffic proposals from Lindsay Reed and Denise Grant, both senior planners who know an awful lot about these proposals. There were also traffic studies done for the two homestead buildings as well as the one at the Capitol Theater site. Um, traffic studies, as I mentioned earlier, are very hard to read, but the one thing that I've found is that none, all these traffic studies are done separately. None of them are a coordination of all this stuff that's going on in, our, in, the, in the North Block. Um, there's occasional reference to the other developments, but there is no overall study that shows the impact. None of these, uh, well, may, very few of these developments are gonna provide sufficient parking for all their tenants. We're gonna be losing the parking spot behind SNR and behind the Good Life Building. Um, where are these people gonna park? Where are the employees and the staff who work in the downtown shop and restaurant going to park? City monthly parking is at a premium right now. You can't have these people run out and feed the meter every two hours. When I had my dental practice, parking for staff was an ongoing problem, and I guarantee it's gonna get worse. 
Where are the tourists in the city going to park? Where are all the people attending the concerts and the conventions and the hockey games going to park if all the ground level parking is already taken by the people who are residing in these buildings? What happens in the winter when we have a heavy snowfall? The snow banks left in winter, effectively, you lose a lot of that ground level parking on the streets. It's just the banks are too, too high. In winter, you can't park in the downtown core. It's prohibited because the city staff has to get in there and clean the snow away. 30 seconds. I knew I'd run over. I could go on and on and on. Um, this is not a good development. Um, traffic studies, uh, all this is scary. Uh, I don't know why we don't look at other alternatives for buildings like this. Why are we not looking at vacant lands off Montreal Street and in the old tannery site? The new half directives from the federal government initiated by the CMHA, there's money there for brownfield uh, cleanup. There will be a lot less problems with traffic. Um, as well, these locations are still within walking distance of the downtown core. Um, Thank you. If you have any more questions or comments, I would ask you to send them by email. I will or submit this. Yes. Thank you. Anyways, that's my take on it, and I feel very passionate about it. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on down. Uh, again, my name is Kathleen O'Hara. I live at 91 King Street East. I have to comment about the uh, fellow who said that Toronto is thrilling, etc. A lot of people are leaving Toronto just because of what it's become. 90-story buildings at Bay and, uh, and Young and Bloor, I mean, they've just gone to excess. My brother, who has worked there for years, is wanting to retire in Kingston. I have a feeling that might change. Um, I agree with what the previous speaker said. We have lots of empty spaces. We don't have to cram everything downtown. Um, the North Kingstown Secondary Plan has identified a whole strip of, build of empty spaces along Montreal and Division. We've got more than 20 parking lots around Kingston. Why aren't we dealing with them, filling all of this in with the missing middle, with a few high rises in places where they won't be as offensive? There is an, a high rise being built near the third crossing. Well, it's already pretty ugly there. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, we have to build where it's compatible. Um, so, um, and not, sir, on the tannery property. Let's leave the trees until we've filled in everything else. Um, let me see. London, my daughter lives in London, Ontario. They have put lots of high rises downtown. They've tried to maintain the historic streets, but it's so ugly when you go down there. You're so, you're in the shadows. You're, you're alienated by the height of the high rises. I'm not a shopping center person, but I don't go down t downtown in London because it's not worth it. It's, it's just not attractive. It's not a special experience. So you might as well get a good parking spot at a shopping mall and do your, your shopping there. And this will happen in Kingston too, I guarantee it. How do ha European cities maintain their beauty and their history and they're packed with tourists. Why can't we be as smart and, and original and, and intelligent? We just have to say we want a certain kind of city and we want to go, go along with the official plan with its zoning limits and, and be a government and, and provide leadership. Um, I think that's all I was going to say. Yeah, that's all I was going to say. But I, again, I want to s agree with the man who spoke first before me. We, we don't need this kind of development. It will be the beginning. Next, it will be a 30-story, and then it'll be a 40, and the city will be gone. I mean, the homestead buildings, 19 and 23, now we've got 25. It will be incremental change, and once you've set those precedents, 
you won't be able to say no. And I'm beginning to worry about whether we'll be able to say no now because we've let so much happen. But maybe we can try, and I hope you do. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, please come on down. Sorry, there, got it. Thank you, Rob, for what you've said. Um, we have a very special downtown core. We have huge traffic problems. Even little things like trying to get into the Hotel Do and then putting the parking lot across the street in the same place. I watched a person with a walker not be willing to go to the lights and damn near get killed the other day. We, we don't understand the traffic that's happening in downtown. It's horrendous and people are not being, I watched a car, you know, just honking and honking at a pedestrian who was walking with their rights. This number of parking spaces for this building is also not plausible. It's not going to happen. And, and Rob's right. People will be taking up the spaces in the area. That's a huge concern for me. We had Elrond built years ago, Princess Towers, whatever you want to call it. It's one of the most ugly buildings I've ever seen in my life. I watched Dermot, whatever his name is, Irish architect, who has incredibly beautiful buildings all around the world. If we want to put a building up that's going to be spectacular, that's going to be huge, let's make it beautiful. That is not a beautiful building, and that is not what our city deserves. We have, one of, we have an absolute gem in this city. Oh, sure, I grew up with the Fairbanks Morse buildings, and my father was the uh, alderman who helped get um, our Confederation Park, and we've done some good things with our city, but we cannot keep letting these monster buildings happen in, the, uh, in, the, in this core. We just can't. I understand it's a tax benefit for the city, but it's just, it's just not right for the downtown. Thank you. Pardon? Uh, anyone else from the uh, public in this room? Please, come on down. Hello again, my name is Joel Thompson. My address is 882 Clearfield Crescent. My question again is clarity tonight on a breakdown of average unit size for each style of unit. What I would also like to stress to council and members of the public is the applicant's sister project at 223 Princess Street. I was involved in the pre-sales of the initial application for multiple buyer clients. What I can tell you is after years of litigation and delays, the prices on the finalized application were almost twice the price of the original sales and half the size because of delays in construction and restrictions in overall height and size. Additionally, do you have an estimate on the assessed value of the finished project and future property tax revenue expected to be generated per year? For reference, the current property is assessed at $4.5 million and generates just over $171,000 per year in property taxes as per MPAC. If we average $500,000 per unit with 287 units, then the assessed value could be as high as $143.5 million or $5.4 million in new property tax revenue that could be used for special projects like helping our homeless or building additional affording housing projects. We desperately need to be adding new sources of tax revenue to our tax base instead of the proposed 3.5% annual increase in next year's property taxes. Again, I would like to thank the applicant for continuing to submit development applications in our great city. Thank you. Would anybody else in the uh, room like to speak? May I ask, is there anybody online? There are two, oh, there, there's a gentleman that wishes to speak, but I will also just remind the two people while he moves over to his podium uh, that are all attending us online, although I do recognize one of them is a counselor, uh, uh, that if you would like to speak, please raise your virtual hand in Zoom and we'll be able to recognize you at that point. But with that out of the way, happy to turn it over to you over there on the podium. Uh, my name is Robert McInnes. I live at 278 Sydenham Street. 
And um, I want to <laughs> draw attention to the fact that uh, this escalation in the height of buildings is part of a developer's game. What they do is they say they will increase the height from the highest building around, and then they will negotiate a lower, a lower height, a lower density, a few less, you know, a few more trees, or a smaller setback. And this is a problem because this is escalating the cost of housing, because this is inflationary. What happens is that because a developer has uh, been able to build a 25-story building, the adjacent property, all the adjacent properties became, become worth more money. And so the next person who wants to develop has to pay a huge amount of money for the land that they are going to develop on. So we really need to tackle this problem. And the planning department and you, the planning uh, body here, have a responsibility to try to tackle this problem. I realize that we have a problem with our uh, provincial government pushing this upon us all the time. But for instance, uh, the planner here suggested that we need to buy, build 8,000 new homes, but he didn't say when we should start. He said when we should finish. But from my account, we have already committed to three or 4,000 new homes in the last two or three years. I would love to know what the real numbers are that we have said approved to. Maybe we haven't got building permits yet, but we've approved a vast amount of new housing. And so it's just an escalation all the time, and it's a push from the developing community because they are exceedingly rich people, and they can afford to put high-in-the-sky proposals up, and they can afford to influence people who, who, to, to help build their proposals. I also want to say that it's, it's, a, it's a wonder to most citizens how possible that we have a zoning plan and we always ignore it. I mean, it's, to most people, that's ridiculous. How could, why do we have a zoning bylaw if we never stick to it, if we always say, oh, no, we didn't really mean that. We really mean that we want more density. Well, if you mean that, why don't we say it? Why don't we say, oh, you can build to this density and you can build to this height, and then the citizens would be able to say, no, but we're playing the game. Now, I'm sure all the planners in this room and all, most of you who are in the planning committee have read Jane Jacobs' books about American cities. What she explained, and everybody who I've ever talked to in the planning business agrees with that you, if you want to have a good city, you have to have people on the street who live on the street. If you're building tower blocks all the time, you're not functioning that way. When you're not functioning as a society because you've negated your society. What you've done is put everybody into this little, little box all by themselves who don't have to associate with anybody else. We know that this, what the proposals that are put forward tonight are not the answer to our housing problems. We know this, yet we are being forced to do something that we don't want to do. Now, I, I, I realize that we're confronted with Homestead land holdings here. We're confronted with one of the biggest developers in the whole, not only of Kingston, but the whole of Canada. And that co company is very, very powerful. And how do you stop a company from that, like that, from doing whatever the damn well please? It's not often that we have the opportunity to speak against these things, and I think we should speak out, and I think we should ask the community for their opinion, not just in a little meeting like this, which hardly anybody knows about, but generally to the public. What do you think? Do you think this is a reasonable way to develop our city? 30 Most seconds. of our citizens would probably say no. Thank you. Thank you. Please come on up.
My name is Mary Jo Carrier. I live at 135 Ontario Street on the 11th floor in a little tiny box. And I've lived here for two and a half years. I live in block, uh, what a lot of people know as Block D, and I work downtown. I have an eight-minute commute on foot, so short that I can't use my bike because there's really no sense. And I can't tell you what a change in my lifestyle has done to myself and my husband uh, moving here to Kingston and having that kind of life. The reason we have that life is because Kingston is set up for, headed towards a walkable community. And to be transparent, I'm also the executive director of Downtown Kingston BIA. I have 700 members in my uh, jurisdiction that I talk to on a regular basis. And I'm not worried about, <laughs> I'm not worried about losing our community because we're building tall buildings. I'm worried about losing our community if we don't build tall buildings. We need to intensify and densify the area within 15 minutes of our downtown so people stop crowding our parking spaces with cars and start walking on their feet and using their, their bikes and their scooters and creating community in the downtown core. A lot of the, the community in the downtown core live in Block D. Block D is changing as we speak. It used to be probably um, middle to elderly. Now it's quite elderly. A lot of the elderly are moving on and we're seeing a whole slew of new people moving into our, into our buildings, which is really nice to see. Um, up, upscale professionals that have the expendable income that supports the downtown core. The downtown core will not be here if we don't start respecting the fact that the 700 members downtown, which are property owners and business owners, need people with money to spend to come to their facility. If we continue to try and stop that kind of intensification and densification, what's going to happen? I suspect we're going to have a lot of suburbs. That's not going to help the downtown. The West End and the East End intensification of those areas doesn't help downtown and it doesn't help the historic uh, beauty and, and uniqueness of downtown. I think somebody mentioned Montreal and Toronto uh, a little while ago. <laughs> Someone there, I think uh, Connie did as well. Very excellent examples. Victoria is another example of an eclectic mix of old and new and communities that have been able to create neighborhoods and communities that know each other when they go down the street, that support the local business owners. And for, for everybody's information in the room, COVID is not anywhere near over for our small businesses. I cannot stress that enough. We didn't have a good summer. Our Pedestrian counts are down because we didn't have a good tourism um, push through the summer. We also had smoke in June and rain in July, et cetera. So our business owners who now are overburdened with loans that they've taken out are going to be asked to pay back their loans shortly and then are going to have to go into winter with no stockpile from summer. We're going to see a lot of people go out of business. And in terms of of the difference between does this, does this help affordable housing? This isn't an affordable housing issue. This is building a community in the downtown core that can support and sustain the people that have already invested money, time, family, their lives, their expertise to make and restore and retain, I think, one of the most impressive, incredible downtown cores that I've ever seen, and I've done a lot of traveling around the world. 30 seconds. I'm done. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Anyone else in this room? I'll ask, is there anybody online? 
There is only a counselor that is online, so uh, they are entitled to speak later if they so wish. Okay, back to the public. Going once, <laughs> going twice. No, unfortunately not. No. And okay, now we go to the committee. So once again, please uh, consider. Oh yeah, sorry. There's questions, of course. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I'll have to take my colleagues at Arcadis out at some point because they definitely uh, got a lot more questions than me. So as much as we're competitors, we're, we're friends as professionals. Um, so mostly what I heard uh, were comments this evening, and none of these comments are, are taken lightly. I do appreciate everyone that took the time to come here uh, this evening to to express their comments, uh, both concerns and, and both, uh, and also the, the positive aspects of, of bringing more housing to downtown Kingston in, in a tall built form. Um, and, you know, I, I had mentioned it in my presentation, and it was mentioned uh, how, you know, maybe it came across that I was too casual in our open house on September 6 about, you know, why 25 stories, and, and I had responded you know, I'll pose the question back, why not 35? And, and the reality is when, when we're looking at these projects, there's two different things that are occurring. The development team, which is made up of people like myself as a land use planner, urban designers, heritage experts, traffic engineers, we are, we are pushing the developer to, to make a product that meets, meets policies and that can pass those policy tests. And the results of that test are the building that you, that you see before you. And, mo and most certainly, past approvals are looked at. And the, the homestead approvals were looked at. We looked at them and we looked at how, how we might compare and how we also might not offend those, those developments, being as we're also very close to them. Um, but I, but I will suggest to this room that that there will be other tall buildings in this area because this is the best suited area of downtown for intensification because it has less heritage significance as to when you you land on Brock or Princess or closer to where we are uh, this evening. And the question was raised: Where where will they park? Well. We're meeting the zoning bylaws requirements of 0.4 spaces per unit. And I appreciate that sounds low, but that is the direction that this city has taken. The city has said, we want to have less parking overall and, and have that shift, which includes everything from, from being able to walk to most places where you want to go, and downtown is just one of those places where that can occur. It was mentioned how the buildings are not so much about the tower and it's not so much about the podium, and those are urban design principles. The focus of the buildings today is on that interaction with the street, the first few floors, the commercial spaces. That is a very critical design element, and, and what you're seeing direction from staff that hasn't even made its way into policy yet. You know, policy says put your building right at zero, put it right at the property line. That's what our policy still says. But in working on a handful of these buildings now and seeing how the buildings built to zero interact with our narrow Kingston streets, we've worked with, with staff, even though it hasn't made it into policy yet, to pull the buildings back and to create those, those better streets. That's all part of the design and iterative process. It was mentioned about, about the um, you know, private sight lines not being um, you know, regulated. And, and, and for context, the, the comment is that, that if, you know, I, I'll use a simpler example of, of a waterfront property. If you live on the wrong side of the street and your neighbor develops a house on the waterfront, you don't have the right to look through their property. And so what the city of Kingston has done, where those sight lines are important, and you saw that on the previous project at Bay Street, there are lines captured in policy that have to be protected. 
and 64 barrack doesn't impact any of those lines. I'll just move through the comments here. Well, there was a question about the average uh, unit size, and I think at this point I'd like to turn it over to Mark Vilmer, who's online, and if, if he could speak to uh, some of the, the unit sizes while I spoke more high level to the, the bedroom count. Mr. Chair, if you could turn it to Mark. Thank you, Mike. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Mark Vilmer. I'm a managing partner here at SRM Architects, joined by one of my colleagues, uh, Jeff Atkinson, the project architect, as well as uh, Maha Safar, one of the designers on our file. So specifically, the question about the size of the units, we get this a lot, and uh, uh, we're often pressed uh, by uh, developers or uh, just any person from the public as part of these public meetings, uh, wanting large units uh, while wanting lots of parking, while wanting it to be uh, attainable and affordable. And so the, the challenge, of course, is, as Mike uh, identified early, Construction costs have gone up significantly. And so we're under a phenomenal amount of pressure to try and come up with the most economical buildings to build so that they're sustainable, but also they're viable, they're market viable. Uh, so with respect to the size of the units, uh, we have a pretty typical floor plate after the uh, levels two and three that have some uh, uh, strange geometry from the step back perspective. But we get on a typical tower floor plate, <clears throat> Uh, the four bedroom units uh, range anywhere between 650 to 670 square feet. Uh, that depends if they have, uh, you know, a den or, or no den. Uh, and then we have also one bedroom, sorry, uh, two bedroom units. Uh, and those, uh, those are the 650, 670, and the, the one bedroom units are smaller. Those are about 440 to 570, again, depending on if there's inbound conditions. And so the, the, the challenge is, given construction costs, we're trying to make units as small as possible, uh, that still meet the market requirements, but that's a way that they can actually be affordable uh, if it is indeed uh, a sold project, uh, as opposed to uh, rental projects. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, and Mr. Chair, there was just one more one more question that I'll I'll take an attempt at, but may may need to rely on staff to help fill in some of the gaps. So the question was asked about you know, what is the real number in Kingston? Because I had mentioned this target of 8,000 units by, 20, by 2030, 2031. And in the easiest way to kind of look at that answer is to look at the building permits that have been uh, issued kind of year by year. And I don't have all the stats in my head for, for going back a few years, but I believe last year was just a touch over a thousand uh, building permits uh, were issued for residential units, but it, it might be a benefit to defer maybe more detail to staff if they want to touch on something, uh, an answer to that effect. Thank you. Thanks, and through you, Chair, this is something that we've been talking about internally for a while, and I know brought several reports forward to you for consideration, but between 2021 and 2031, the City of Kingston has been allocated by the provincial government their responsibility and requirement to build 8,000 new units across the city. So that averages out to about 800 units a year. Since the number has come out, we've exceeded it every year. We're on track to do the same this year. Uh, but those numbers are our provincially mandated minimum requirement that we have to meet. And it's something that we have front of mind when we're going through development approvals, when we're looking through the building permit process in order to bring these units online. So. That is the number that is in the back of our mind all the time when we're working through development approvals. Thank you. Okay, so now we will turn to the committee and if you have any questions that can be answered through email offline, I would prefer that you do that. Uh, if you have any comments or questions that uh, need to be asked, please ask them now. Councillor Sanek, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, through you. Uh, Mr. Keene, you said that the building will be pulled back by two to three meters, and your, um, your picture up there showed like trees. So um, do you have any ideas with um, what type of landscaping this uh, footprint could have? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair, thank you for that question. And, and you know, the 
Councilor Osanek, that's one of the exact reasons why staff are asking us to pull back the buildings is so that we can have real landscaping on the streets, particularly where the streets are narrow and the sidewalks are right on the curb and they're the road, you know, road sidewalk building. So it does provide the opportunity for landscaping and to provide trees, maybe in some cases small trees. We, we haven't got to the landscape plan for this project yet, uh, but, but certainly the, the landscaping of this area is critical along with you know, helping to provide some of those patio spaces for the commercial tenants as well. Thank you. And is it correct that the uh, current commercial tenants on the site, um, they won't be part of this development, is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, I don't know that I could be that specific. I, I, I can tell you that the, the lease for good life is, is ending in March with the, you know, the previous owner, and so that, that lease will stay. There are opportunities for uh, good life to stay downtown if they choose. And in similar vein, the other tenants, while this building is removed, could certainly work with our owners group to find other spaces downtown if they would like to do that. Thank you. Um, looking at, um, I think it's, it's got it in front of me, Exhibit B in our package. Um, yeah, I don't like the look of that. <laughs> Uh, I would rather it look more like Anna Lane, you know, like, um, you know, I, I don't know. To me, like, it needs to fit into the historic downtown somehow and not stick out so much with, um, I know it's just a depiction, it's like some high-level concept plan, but if we do have 24 sto 25 stories like that, this is just, um, it's too ugly, it's too modern for the downtown. It would look fine in the suburbs, but uh, not for the downtown. So I just wanted to put that out there because um, it is right there as the concept plan. Um, also too, uh, a lot of now the comments will be the same that have already been said, but this is a different community meeting. So I have to say it for the minutes and I would rather these be rentals and uh, you know, take, you take advantage of that HST exemption that the feds and the province are gonna be offering. Um, I could maybe be talked into supporting 25 stories if it's rentals, but if it's condos, you have to knock off, in my opinion, 10 stories at least, right? <laughs> That's what I would like to see, like you gotta knock it off, you gotta lower the height. We don't need more condos, but I know we can't control that. Um, I would prefer rentals here, that's for sure. And then um, whether it's 15 stories or the 25 stories, um, the same thing, you know, bird friendly, because it's gonna really stick out. We saw in your schematic showing the two homestead places and then also, um, you know, like plast arms in the background that this really sticks out. It's gonna be a beacon for the birds, right? Flying over and their migratory pathway. Unfortunately, Kingston's on the migratory pathway. I wish it wasn't, but we have to consider that. So the bird friendly um, glass, like from the city of, of Toronto, best practices for glass safety and uh, no spotlights on it. And um, uh, yeah, like for the terrace up there, um, is there a terrace? We don't really talk about that, but you can see that there's like long glass panels up on the rooftop. So um, no spotlights up there and just the red lights to make it safer for the birds. Um, I think that's it, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the committee? Oh. Do you have a hand? Just, just maybe a quick, quick attempt at answering some of the, the points. And thank you for those, those questions, Councillor Osanek. Um, the, the government's introducing new programs almost weekly right now. So like the last few weeks we saw the rental one. And, and as I said, like the, the tenure's not set at this point. You know, the, <laughs> programs such as that can change things. So certainly right now with our planning reports, we had noted it would be a condo development. Um, the Architects SRM has done many buildings in the GTA in Southern Ontario. So I'm, I'm sure they're very familiar with the, the bird-friendly uh, glass policies of Toronto. So be sure to take that back uh, for consideration because that's important to us. 
And I also want to highlight the, the point about the, uh, the mechanical penthouse, because I'm actually very happy to hear you thought that it was a terrace, because in this case, there's actually no rooftop amenity up there. A building of this nature, as was, as was discussed in the previous application, the, the, um, the mechanical needs are on the roof, whether it's elevator overruns, stair overruns, uh, HVAC needs, all of that ends up on the roof. And so this proposal would, would enclose that uh, through the design the architects have proposed. So, so that is not uh, living space, it's not terrace amenity space, it is purely uh, a proposed hat to close in the mechanical needs of the building. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the committee? Councillor Glenn, go ahead. Don't worry, three, Mr. Chair, I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to go to the aesthetics because, again, this isn't just about height. This is about that sense of place that we discussed in strategic planning. And I really hope that developers who are working with us will read it um, and will listen to what this community is saying about how it wants certain areas to look. Um, I do think the height is extraordinarily tall for the area we're speaking of, and we must move to densification of that. Um, I have no doubt. However, I think the community members raised some very valid points, um, and you do need to be careful with the why not 35. Um, it's a sensitive issue here, and consideration for the people who already reside here is crucially important because they are the ones that maintain this city um, during the down periods when we don't have tourists. Um, and I'd hate to see more and more of them leave. So um, I won't, again, belabor the points. Uh, I do have one quick question though, and that's with regards to the size of the units because it seems that most of the building that we're doing, the units are quite small. Um, having lived in Toronto, I did live in a condo where the unit was sufficient enough to live there with a family. Uh, so can you speak to the size of the units for me? And that's all I'll have to ask for now. Certainly, and, and through you, Mr. Chair, it won't take the comments on aesthetics and, and height lightly. You know, the team is here. We're listening both online and, and in the room tonight. And, um, the, you know, the architects are online and have spoken. So, so I'll, I'll start with, again, just kind of the the breakdown of the rooms in the units, and I might have uh, architect Mark uh, pop back on to mention those sizes again. But it is a mix of one bedroom, one bedroom with den, two bedroom with den, and right now just one three bedroom. As the design evolves, that will fluctuate a bit because right now the plans are conceptual for zoning purposes to establish a zoning envelope. So I'll turn it over to Mark again, more to speak to the square footage of the units, if I may, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mike. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, to reiterate, the, uh, the layouts are conceptual, and uh, there's certainly going to be a degree of changes in terms of the finalized unit sizes and unit mix as proposed. Uh, but at this time, to reiterate, uh, we've got a majority of uh, eight um, eight typical units per floor that are one bedroom, which range between 400 and 440 to 570 uh, square feet. Uh, and we have uh, four two bedroom units per floor typical, which range between 650 and 670 square feet. So these are not uh, very large three bedroom units. You know, these are, uh, these are relatively uh, efficient one and two bedroom layouts uh, that are effectively driven by market forces. And so uh, the, the envelope is quite conducive to any uh, ratios of units. And so that's something that we uh, continue to develop with the team and the marketing team. And we made sure that uh, if a project like this is uh, supported and approved and goes to launch, uh, that what's being offered in terms of unit sizes and, and amounts of those units is something that the public at large does actually want to live in. And that's the, the economic viability of this project is everything because there's no point getting something to prove that no one wanted to live in. And uh, so this is why uh, 
uh, that's the current uh, mandate that we've been using to determine the size of the units. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee? Councillor Shaves. Thank you. Um, first, I want to address something you mentioned during your presentation. Uh, you mentioned that the parking lot, the underground parking lot, may be altered due to the information about flooding. What effect would that have on the building itself? Are we talking not having any parking, adding the four floors on top, or just removing four floors of rentals? Certainly, and through you, Mr. Chair, you, you know, we're striving, marketing and zoning are aligned in this case. We want to hit that parking ratio of about 0 0.4 spaces per unit. Might we be 0.38, might we be 0.41? It's possible, we're still, still refining. So as, what we're learning through the technical review is some of these flooding issues. So what that could mean is that we could end up with two parking floors underground and you could end up with parking floors above the, the first floor like to hit that ratio of about 0 0.4. So right now the proposal is showing four floors underground. The flooding risks may not allow us to do that. So that will be refined. But what won't be lost is that, that streetscape that we have to maintain on both Barrick and Wellington. So just take that further. Um, so if you're moving two floors above ground, are you increasing the height or are you just removing two residential floors? No. So through you, Mr. Chair, there would be no change in height at this point. If, just to, to qualify that, if we were to make a substantial change like that, it would have to come back before this committee for another public meeting. We have no intentions of making a substantial change to the proposal because we want to work fast toward an approval, ideally appreciating that this, that's up to this committee and council. Um, but we want to work toward a building permit, so we want to minimize substantial change to what you see before you tonight. Okay, because I do believe it is pushing the limit at 20, um, and we do do, do applicants at a case-by-case -case basis, so there may be applications for 25, 30, 35 floors later, but that will be done on a case-by-case -case basis and may or may not be approved. Um, in regards to parking, there is, well, I do have concern with parking. We may be moving ahead of it uh, and reducing the parking spaces. That Those decisions were done before this council. There are park, parking issues throughout the city, and I do understand that the location will allow people to walk downtown and do the majority of the, the purchasing. However, there may be individuals who may want to purchase things outside the downtown, maybe the West End, which will need vehicles. I noticed that you don't have any car sharing uh, spaces within your proposal. So, so through you, Mr. Chair, we're working with staff to refine the parking ratios. So, you know, overall we're, we're targeting this point four, but I do expect there will be both visitor and car share spaces. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at, at one or two. I mean, on the car share issue, I've, I've actually done a lot of research on that in the city of Kingston. And for a number of years, the city had six car shares, like six vehicles available. And this year, earlier this year, they increased that to eight. So there are, there, there's one company right now in the city that operates. And a few years ago, it absorbed the other company that was operating. So there's a sole car share provider at this moment with eight cars uh, citywide. So we do want to take car share uh, into account and provide for the future growth of those companies or new companies coming to town. So we'll certainly be providing one or two car share spaces and we'll have to work out what that right number is with, with staff as we, we progress through the technical comments. Because I do believe that's one of the criteria, bring down the parking spaces allowable. Because I believe one car share is equal to 10 or 12 yeah. regular car spaces from the previous meeting. So through you, Mr. Chair, yes, I think they in their previous application they said eight, so they could take every car in the city in their in their lot. I think maybe they, well, so. it's a different matter, but maybe they should expand their business. On the greener side of aspects, and you probably heard me mention this before, um, I didn't notice any EV parking, and what other green space uh, initiatives are you taking, you know, like green rooftop, um, heating, drip thermal, things like that, in order to reduce GHGs. 
Well, certainly, and, and thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, there, the spaces will be set up for EV parking. It's part of the building code requirements, so they, they will be set up, and absolutely there will be EV parking uh, in the parking lot uh, of this building. And similar on the green initiatives, absolutely there will be green aspects of this building, particularly because the building code has changed to the point that, that it's required. And there are different paths for how to achieve building efficiencies. So those exact paths aren't known at this moment, but it could be everything from exploring um, the, the air exchangers versus uh, geothermal, for example. You know, air exchangers have become a lot more efficient. They, they, there was a point they didn't work well in our climate below minus 15 Celsius. They've improved the tech. So right now, we don't know. We're still at the zoning preliminary, but absolutely there will be many of those green initiatives will be, will be worked into this building through the project. Thank you. I know it's early in the, in the development process, but just want to keep those in mind and try to get the building down at net zero as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the committee? Great. I would recognize Councillor Ridge. Certainly. Councillor Ridge, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, through you. So just a couple questions about, because I already spoke about uh, my concerns for traffic in the previous proposal. Um, just going back to the sight line issue for this building, is this, or sorry, this proposal, is this proposal in violation of any of the protected sight lines uh, in city plans? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, no. It does not impact any of those points of view or heritage sight lines. Okay, and so, thank you. And um, can I be given a bit of a, just a summary about the impact of the shadowing in the area? Thank you. Certainly, and, and through you, Mr. Chair, um, we did do a detailed shadow analysis uh, on the site, both as part of our design exercise and where we landed with the tower. And that also included looking at the proposed homestead building, which is already approved, so that we could see the compounded effect of more than one tall building in this area. And as is typical in, in downtown Kingston, because of the orientation of the streets, the shadows move quickly. So they, they move very quickly because of the angle of the streets not being that perfect north-south, east-west orientation. And there, there, is, there is always a change when it comes to shadow. So there, there is a change that will be experienced uh, on, on those, those uh, buildings along Wellington Street, but the shadow moves quickly and so the, the impact is, is measurable and minimal in my opinion. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Chair, um, one last question. Is the dome of City Hall um, obscured by the building when viewed from one of the viewpoints of the water? So through you, Mr. Chair, in, in this case, there would be no viewpoints that would, be, that would even come close for this site for City Hall. We're quite removed from the City Hall view lines, both from the on city street perspective and from the water perspective. Thank you. Okay, and uh, just as one final comment, Mr. Chair, um, I'm just going to uh, briefly um, echo some of the comments that were made both by Councillor Glenn and Councillor Shaves. Um, uh, while I, I do understand the point that the presenter is making about current provincial trends and, and the, the necessity for density, it is important that when we are discussing these items specifically around uh, precedent, uh, potential precedent breaking uh, development, that the, the height issue is dealt with uh, sensitively. So um, I, I appreciate, I thank uh, the presenter and I thank everybody for attending and thank you for my, uh, answering my questions. 
Thank you. Last chance for the committee. Okay, let's close this public meeting and open up the regular business. So, call a meeting to order. May I have an approval of the agenda with the added? Councillor Shapes, Councillor Chinani, all in favor? Passes unanimously. Confirmation of the minutes at the minutes of Planning Committee meeting number 15, 2023, held Thursday, September 20, or September 7th, 2023, be approved. Mover, please. Councillor Chinani, Councillor Glenn, all in favor? Passes unanimously. Uh, no disclosures of pecuniary history, no delegations, no briefings, no business, no motions, notices of motion, none. Other business, none. Correspondence, you see the addendums. Um, next meeting, October 11th, 2023 at six o'clock. Uh, move to adjourn. Oh. Councillor Shaves, Councillor Glenn, all in favor, let's go home. <laughs>